Vrakas made us from stone to protect Girdlegard. Against orcs, ogres, and all the other beasts of Teon. We are the guardians of Girdlegard. We are the children of the Divine Smith. We are the Dwarves. On the way! That's that! Alright! Understood! And stay dead! Charge! A present from the workshop! And again! My king! What are you doing here? Gizelbert I and I, the father of the Fifthling clan, has not been on the front line of battle against the creatures of Teon for many cycles. The king surveys the battlefield and the defenders with a grave expression. <sighs> We are too few. This you know as well as he does. But there will be no reinforcements arriving. Hundreds of brave warriors lie inside the fortress dying. The illness is running rampant. It brings weakness and death. Stay at your posts. Be as steadfast as the granite of which we are made. Nothing can break us. Vrakas is with us. Come here, you! <laughs> On my way! That's 
Is that? Come here! <laughs> and again! Yes! What is it? Another one gone! <laughs> Yes! Come ah. here and die! Ha! Ah. Uh. Over oh, there! Yeah. Hammer time! Ah. Come Four here, you! That's that? Yes! Ah! <laughs> what is it? Be off with you! <laughs> Ah! Ha! What is it? <laughs> Another one gone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes! These are the ones who attacked us in the tunnels. We suffered great losses beating them back. Come here and I'll split you like a straw, you treacherous elf! In his fury, the old king radiates a ferocious power that none of Sitalia's children could withstand. But the slight, willowy being sitting astride the Shadow Mare just grins down, mockingly. You are mistaken. We are Alpha. We are here to destroy the Elves. All peace-loving beings here in Girdlegard are under our protection, and you cannot open the gate that has barred your path into Girdlegard since the creation of the world. Not us, but perhaps one of your kind. This cannot be. Silence, you fool! Fracas, forgive me for what I am about to do. Quickly, in formation! You must hold them back until I close the gate! <laughs>
Look at me. I am Syntharas, the reaper of your death. I will take your life, and the land will take your soul. Get out of my sight, pointy ears, and let me delight at the closed gate a little longer. The gate may have closed, but when you rise again from the dead by the power of the land, you will be one of us, and you will open it. Never! My soul belongs to Brakas. No, your soul now belongs to the land, and henceforth you will belong to it forever. Now die, and return. Then hand us Girdle Guard. <laughs> You're a perfectionist, Tongue del Bolifar. I've got a reputation to uphold. If you can't rely on the metalwork of a dwarf, what can you rely on? What can I do for you? For me, nothing. It's Lot Yonan. He wants to see you in his study. In your mind, you go through all the recent incidents that might have annoyed the Magus. Apart from a few little squabbles with his famuli, nothing worth mentioning happened since the incident with your beard. You nod. Okay. You look dreadful. What a charmer. The maid gives you an ironic, reprimanding scowl. Ikana has been crying half the night. When you were teething, I carried you around the vaults. You played with my beard and I sang you to sleep. Prala smiles. She's heard this story many times before. That was 23 cycles ago. But I'm quite sure you didn't sing. You might have grumbled a bit. If what you've read about the Dwarven lifespan is true, it'll be another 300 sun cycles and more before you are called to the Eternal Forge. The certainty of one day having to witness Frala's death already burdens your heart. I'd better not keep the Magus waiting. See you later. There's goulash for dinner. Hey, Groundling! Come to the kitchen, we need you! Jollison, a fourth-degree Famulus and your favorite foe among the students of magic, gives you a disparaging glance and disappears without waiting for your reply. Tongue deal! Quick! Or the goulash will get burnt! You immediately recognize what the problem is. A chain running over a pulley for positioning the cauldron is detached from its mounting and the cauldron stuck in the fireplace. It's a heavy load, and none of the famuli, who feel superior even during kitchen duty, dare do anything. They might burn their fingers, or even get a bit dirty. Vegetables, bread, cheese, but the cook is not to be trifled with. Many painful knuckles have taught you that she knows how to handle her heavy wooden spoon, and that she may possibly have eyes in the back of her head. I just wanted... The stew, quickly now. It'd be a waste of goulash. And I'm hungry. Here, hold this. Do you remember when you dyed my beard with some magic spell? I had to shave it off. You stroke your beard, which is unusually short for a dwarf. Damn it! Ah, oh, it's heavy! The young human forces through his pursed lips, letting the pot sink a little. Don't you dare ruin my goulash, boy! The cook, with beefy forearms, glares at the young man, and after a brief moment, 
he tries harder. With as much concern in your voice as you can muster, you say, Oh, no, no, this doesn't look good. You're pleased to notice he's dripping with sweat. <laughs> I'll get you back for this, groundling! You damned freak! For a moment, you hope the Famulus really does raise his hand to you. But then he comes to his senses and leaves the kitchen, his face bright red. What a pair you are! The beer that is delivered to the vaults is supposed to be the best beer in Iddersleyn. It's certainly your favourite beer. But you haven't drunk enough other beers to truly know. What are you doing, groundling? We're still eating here. Why don't you go and get your own portion? Master Lot Yonan, Frala told me you wished to speak with me. Ah, Tungdil, come in. Uh, there is a bag over there in the cupboard. Take it out, please. It contains artifacts belonging to my former Famulus Goren. I wish to return them to him. He's in Black Saddle, 300 miles away. 300 miles? That's a long journey. Who are you going to entrust with this? I was thinking of you. Me? There is no one better to take on this journey. You have acquired much knowledge. You are almost a scholar. You know more than most family about Girdlegard and its inhabitants. It is time for you to go out into the world and see it with your own eyes. I... with pleasure. What's in the bag? Magical devices. Uh, you better leave the bag closed if you want to avoid any accidents. Dwarves don't really like magic, and magic doesn't like you either. Rackus gave us so much craftsmanship that there's no space left in our bodies for magic. Strictly speaking, every time you've been too close to magic, it has ended in catastrophe. Perhaps I'll meet some dwarves on my travels. Yes, perhaps. But don't hold out too much hope. And be careful who you talk to. Not everyone out there likes dwarves. Yeah, goblins. They abduct baby dwarves and sell them to magi, from what I've heard. Not the best bit of business I've ever done. But what was I to do? The long noses threatened to throw you into the nearest river. Be on your guard. Look after the bag and don't lose it. May Palandiel be with you. And Varakas too, of course. I'll set off immediately. I'll see you soon, Lot Yonan. The goulash is bubbling in the cauldron. You draw the warm air in through your nose, and the smell makes your mouth start watering. Hello, Frala. Hmm? I need provisions for 300 miles. You're grinning from ear to ear. Finally, you've got the chance to see something of the world. Three hundred? Tungdil, that's no errand. That's an epic journey. Wait, I've got just the right thing. But make sure the cook doesn't see. I'm going to Black Saddle to return a few things to a former apprentice in the Magus. You pocket the rye bread, sausages and ham. Enough food for the first few days of your journey. I've got a present for you. 
You take out a symbol of protection that you've carefully made from three horseshoe nails. It's not the finest jewellery in Girdlegard. One look at Frala's face makes it clear that it doesn't matter. She glows with happiness as she takes the pendant. For me? But why? Because you don't see me as an oddity and you're like a little sister to me. You could have said. But you settle with a shrug and a crooked smile. Perhaps I'll even meet some dwarves on the way. Frala throws you a cautious glance. It's a tricky subject that you can't help but broach. There aren't dwarves down here. You're the only one in Idda's Lane, as far as we know. I know, but I can't just have been born out of a rock. Somewhere in the mountains, I have a clan. Maybe even a family. Yes. Maybe. Frala has reminded you more than once that Lot Yonan wrote to the dwarf clans and none of them were missing a dwarf boy. I have to go. I've got a long journey ahead of me. I wish you the blessing of Palandiel and Vrakas to protect you from all danger on your journey. Here, a talisman. Whenever you look at it, think of me. Frala winks at you mischievously. And of getting me a nice present. Nice to see you again, Lot Yonan. It must have been an age since we last met face to face. Nudin, welcome. Please, sit down. No, thank you, my friend. These are urgent matters, and I don't have much time. You must come to Leos Nudin immediately. The perished land is stirring. Are you sure? What makes you think that? I found out about sixty orbits ago, during a visit to the borders. Our magical barriers have weakened and become porous. The Elfa have left their land, and a huge horde of orcs have marched into Girdlegard. Were you able to strengthen the spell with your magic? No. I can't repair the damage alone. We need the combined power of the six. The other four are already on their way here, but we need your help too. I will set off for Parista without delay. Oh, and um, as you're coming, could you also take the opportunity to bring back the things that I lent to you? Of course. I have them already packed in a bag. Oh, thank you. We'll be expecting you. Easily blinded by the sunlight, you squeeze your eyes tightly shut after only a few steps. The time spent underground has made you so sensitive to light that you're forced to seek shelter in the shade of a mighty oak. You reach a small lake by a birchwood. Your feet hurt and your eyes still sting in the unaccustomed sunlight. But a smile spreads across your face nonetheless. You've covered a decent distance on the first day of your big journey. You pitch your camp and lie down to sleep on the hard forest floor. When you awake in the morning, your legs are stiff and achy. Trying not to feel sorry for yourself, you throw your rucksack over your shoulder. You're a dwarf, and dwarves don't complain. Around midday, with the sun high in the sky and the first beads of sweat appearing on your forehead, you see something move next to the road, a few hundred metres ahead. Some crows are pecking at something in the long grass. The creaking leather armour, the clattering rucksack, and a dwarf's inability to be quiet makes the crows flap around as you move from one bush to another. You give up trying to be stealthy, stand up straight, and see two human bodies in the flattened grass.
you look down on a tall, broadly built man. He's wearing dark brown leather armor that is strengthened with iron plates. There's a sword lying next to him. Was he trying to defend himself against something or someone? There is no blood on the sword. A rucksack that probably belonged to one of the dead. It seems to have been searched and then thrown away carelessly. You find a few implements, some provisions and a map. A route is drawn on it from Parista, Nudin's capital, to Lot Yonan's vaults. You don't see any signs of a struggle in the area where the corpses are lying. Were they stabbed by a companion? A stranger could hardly have crept up on them with such sparse cover. A slender man lies in front of you, dressed in an expensive robe. It is in the colors of Turgur the Fair-Faced, one of the six Magi. The dead man must be one of Turgur's famuli. You don't see any wounds. Does this mean that Turgur the Fair-Faced is in Parista and wanted to send Lot Yonan a message? And if so, why didn't he use magic? Did he want to contact him without anyone noticing? Why all this secrecy? I've Rackus. There are some narrow stab wounds in the man's chest. The cuts are too big to have been made by arrows, but too small for sword wounds. The man has the same incisions. It's clear that both men were killed by the same weapon. But what that weapon might be, you cannot say. You scour the area once more and ask yourself what to do next. It's time-consuming and strenuous work digging shallow graves in the ground with a stick and covering the corpses with a few stones but it should at least keep the crows from their feasting for a while. You continue on your way so as to put a few more miles between you and your grisly find before night falls. You see a flickering light through the trees some way from the path. It might come from a campfire. You walk towards the fire with confident strides until you finally make out three broad-shouldered men with axes. Two rabbits are sizzling over the fire. The men are joking with one another, but you can only understand the odd word. They haven't noticed you yet. Once you reach the edge of the firelight, you say amicably, Greetings. My name is... The men jump up and grab their axes. Who's there? Well, I'll be. Is that a grandling? The men look you over suspiciously. My name is Tongdil. I'm only a traveler who would have nothing against a warm fire and some company. <laughs> A groundling wants our company. <laughs> we are honest, hard-working men. Why would we have anything to do with groundlings? Be off with you. The man strengthens his grip on the axe and passes his tongue over his yellow teeth while keeping you in his sights. I... Sod off, groundling. Have I made myself clear? The man comes a step closer. You shrug your shoulders indifferently and take three small steps backwards without taking your eyes off the men. All right. If I'm not welcome here, then I'll go. 
Puck, 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 puck. Good. And don't even think about coming back to stab us in the back or steal from us. We'll keep guard. There's nothing here for grandling scum. Your heart is pounding, and you confront the man a little more courageously than you feel. I'm no thief, and I'm certainly no murderer. I only wanted to see if... Ta! All grandlings are thieves and good for nothings. You find it difficult to take control of your voice again. Have you met many dwarves? Enough to know that you're all dirty thieves. Now consider this. I am a dwarf with an axe, and I don't use my axe for cutting down trees. The men are visibly unsettled and lower their axes a little. The next morning, visions of axes, faces full of hate, fists and heavy boots flicker through your befuddled mind. Your first attempt to move fails when pain shoots through every bone, every muscle and every nerve in your body. It's a long time before you manage to sit up and tend to your wounds in the early sunlight. There's no trace of the woodcutters. They must have thrown you into the undergrowth near the campfire once they were finished with you. You reach the banks of the warder and can see Axeldale on the other side, but there isn't a bridge for far and wide. The fishermen's boats glide over the water, which sparkles in the sun. None of the men seem to notice you while they throw out their nets. You call to the nearest fisherman. He looks across at you briefly before turning away and getting back to his work. You're going to have to find another way of crossing the river. You leave the peaceful banks of the river behind you and continue on your way. You look down on a large village on the banks of the Warder. Some of the village is built on stilts in the river. A wooden bridge spans the fast-flowing water. A huge wooden palisade has been erected to protect the village from attack. The guards on the palisade are watching you. Their armour looks well cared for and well made. The smith who made them knew what he was doing. You conclude that the men depend on the protection the armour offers and aren't just wearing them to look good. They are certainly not villagers. There are small fires burning every 50 steps or so. They are intended to light up the area in front of the palisade in the night, so that orcs can't creep up to within an arrow's reach without being seen. You have spent the last nights under bushes on the hard, cold ground. You are yearning for a good meal and a real bed. The double gate is made of strong planks, sturdy but still much less solid than the fixed parts of the palisade. Security has been forgone here for practical reasons. Never a good idea when building fortifications. Orc skulls? You're not sure it's wise to taunt the beasts with the severed heads of their fellow kind. The wooden palisade encompasses the whole of the large village and is guarded by many men in armour. The stronghold has been constructed in haste, probably only over the last few days, but the work is sound and uninvited guests should find it difficult to gain access. Some of the guards begin to whisper as you near the gate. Hello up there! What brings you to fair good water? And have you seen any orcs on your travels, groundling? The man leaning over the palisade eyes you up and down carefully. Goodwater is well known for its hospitality. A fact that you've just made up yourself. Let me in and I will tell other travellers all about it. I regret to inform you that we cannot allow you to enter. The gate stayed closed once night has fallen. There is certainly no regret showing in the man's face.
I've got 20 pieces of gold here looking for a taker in the village. Ha! Ah! One of your folk might leave his post for 20 pieces of gold, but I say clear off, Groundling. The gates stay closed until tomorrow morning. But... Oh. You think about waiting by the fire until the morning. At least you wouldn't have to go cold. You hardly slept a wink during the night, jumping at the slightest sound. At least I wasn't cold. An uneasy feeling has been your constant companion since you left Goodwater. Every little sound in the forest makes you fear you've been discovered by a horde of orcs. But you reach the end of the day without bumping into any of the greenskins. It seems as though Vrakus has granted you one more day in Girdlegard. As night begins to fall, you pass a large oak tree and decide to call it a day. Near the oak tree, is an abandoned camp with a fireplace, which appears to be a couple of days old. You swing yourself up the trunk and then pull up your baggage after you. You're prepared to sleep in a tree like a bird if it means escaping the orc's attentions. You sling your rope twice around your stomach and the trunk of the tree to stop you from falling accidentally. You close your eyes and dream. You see North Pass and smell the fresh icy wind that sweeps over the peaks of Great Blade and Dragon's Tongue. But the harmony is interrupted by the hideous roar of an unending flood of orcs throwing itself unceasingly against the fortification. You smell the disgusting green blood of the orcs and taste the rancid fat of their armour on your tongue. The bitter taste becomes stronger until it's unbearable and wrenches you out of your dream. You open your eyes and are surprised at the brightness as a glance at the sky confirms that it's still night. Your eyes move towards the ground and what you see makes the blood in your veins freeze. I am Sintras of Son Balsur. My master, Nod On the Doublefold, ruler of the perished land, has elected you, the lords of Taboribor, to be the sword that conquers the south. You mean, you want us to put our necks on the line and be killed by some magus? Lord Yonan and the others will be taken care of. Your task is to create a diversion in the south until my master's plan succeeds. And which of us is the leader? The one that conquers the most land. So Kragna will be the new Grand Lord. He glares at Ushnots and Bashkog. The Kragna Shore Tribe will conquer the most land. Never! We will overwhelm the cities of the Red Bloods quicker than you can set the marrow from a bone. We shall see. You can't believe what you're hearing. If the beasts of Teon ride into battle together, catastrophic cycles lie ahead for Girdlegard. The night in the oak tree was the worst of your life. You spent every single moment afraid that you'd be found and savaged by the orcs. But as the first rays of sun broke through the treetops, the orcs abandoned their camp and left without discovering you. Better safe than sorry. Your eyes scan the deserted camp, and you listen carefully for any noise. But you don't see or hear anything suspicious. Ugh. You're overcome by the urge to vomit. You have, of course, heard the stories. But seeing with your own eyes that orcs actually do eat humans is a long way from just reading about it. 
At least they said twice. I knew it was here. Come on, then. Find that stupid necklace. Hey, Fusco! In front of you! <laughs> A grounding! Perfect crisp on breakfast! You know that you're no warrior, but perhaps you can escape with a diversion. Oink, oink, little peggies! <laughs> Go and get it, and this time, hold it tight! Hey, that one was mine! You're just too slow, dear brother! Too slow? Just wait! Oh, what bad luck for you! Yes? Hit you very hard. <laughs> what is it? Huh? Yeah. Huh? Yes. <laughs> Who's next? Huh? And what now? <laughs> what is it? Another one yes. bites the dust! Huh? Yes? And again! Oh, he didn't hit you very hard! Uh-huh. Killed! <laughs> yes? He hardly huh? put up a fight! Who is you? Who's next? For you! Uh huh? Pow! Huh? Another one bites the dust! Way. As I'm good as done! Oh, On my yes. way! Yes? Yeah. I didn't hit you very hard! Huh? Oh, oh, what you. bad luck for uh -huh. you! Huh? And you die ah! forever! Huh? Vile creature! Which is a hazard! On my way! Put up a fight! Huh? On, On my way! way. As yes, good as done! On, On my course. way! I'm yes, good. yes! As good as done! done. And what now? End oh, it. What luck for you? Huh? I'm not that quick. Yes, oh, right. yes. Well, Say goodbye yes. for her. Yes, yes. So, what is it? Ha ha! Ha 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 ha! Oink oink. That's all? No more orcs? 
Well thought, young friend. Do you happen to be tongued ill? Well thought? But he fought like a... like a... Boindil, what do you expect? He grew up amongst the humans. Who... who are you and how do you know my name? My name is Boindal Hookhand of the Clan of the Swinging Axes. This is my brother, Boindil Doubleblade. We've been sent to find you. Call me our heart. Are there any more piggy snouts around here? There was a meeting last night. The Elfar serve a certain Nod On who calls himself Lord of the Perish Land. They have enlisted three Orchords to cause unrest in the south. Did you hear that, Boendal? Peggy Snouts! The Elfar from San Balzur and the Orcs from Taborabor are working together? And could ally with the Orcs from the Perish Land. The twins look at you solemnly. You all know what that would mean for the people of Girdelgard. You turned up at just the right moment, but are you sure it's me you're looking for? The High King Gundrabor sent us to fetch you and bring you to Ogre's death in the Secondling Realm in the South. So he received the letter from my master? And am I a Secondling? Well, something like that, I guess. We've got to... Yeah, 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 I know what you're gonna say, but it's our duty to get you to the Ogre's Death Fortress in one piece. I thought the duty of dwarves was to protect the innocent in Girdelgard. Lot Yonan and King Brauron will take care of the orcs. We three must be careful. You're not exactly a warrior. But he has broad shoulders and broad hands. There's hope for him yet. So when you've got the chance to split a few orc skulls, you should take it. Then my family was found and the High King wants to bring me back to my clan. No, you're not a secondling. You're a fourthling. And you're to... The High King will tell you all about that once we get to Ogre's death. We should get going. I would be happy to follow you into the realm of the secondlings. In truth, there is nothing I would rather do. But first, I must travel to Black Saddle and return some things to a former Famulus of Lot Yonan. Black Saddle isn't exactly on our way. It's on my way. We can head south as soon as I've carried out Lot Yonan's orders. Well, <laughs> he's certainly got the stubbornness of a dwarf. <laughs> Perhaps we'll be able to make a real dwarf of him on the way. All right, we'll accompany you. The sooner we find that Famulus, the quicker we can get back to the mountains. I'll have to send Lot Yonan a message by Carrier Pigeon on the way. And if we happen to stumble upon a couple of orcs... I like you, but we'll have to find you another name. Bolifar. It's about as good as Lipsmith, Paddletosh, or Blufflegrump. It is stupid, senseless, and definitely not a name of honor. What are you good at? I'm good at reading. Reading? <laughs> You're a scholar? You arrive at a crossroads with a tavern on the corner. A warm light is emanating from its window, lighting up the road around it. A stone sculpture of a sheep stands in front of the door, and above it a sign, swaying gently in the breeze, reads, The Stone Sheep. You enter the tavern with a determined stride, 
and are greeted by a thick wall of pipe smoke. The dozen or so drinkers at the tables turn towards you, then give each other astonished and slightly worried looks. You walk to the nearest empty table with the twins in tow and sit down. The landlord comes out from behind the bar. What can I get you? You hear surly muttering from one of the tables. What are groundlings doing showing their faces here, now of all times? You stand up and turn to the room. This round's on me. The faces of the guests and the landlord brighten up immediately. The landlord gets to work pulling everyone a beer and handing out the tankards. Some of the guests say cheers to you as they get their drinks. We're tired and long for a proper bed. Of course, gentlemen. You spend a restful night in the tavern and then head off on your way again. There are dead orcs lying in the defensive trenches and strewn over the meadows in front of the city. Some of the locals are busy throwing the bodies on pyres, while others repair the minor damage done to the city wall. You enter the city and the garrison at its centre without being spoken to. It is only when you reach a heavy oak door that leads, you assume, to the commanding officer's headquarters that you are halted by a guard. Dwarves, eh? Seems we aren't to be spared anything these days. What do you want? I must speak with your commander. Commander Valor doesn't have time. He's still very busy dealing with the aftermath of the orc attack. I must speak to the commander. It won't take long. The guard's face darkens. Even a minute is too long when the commander is dealing with the orc problem. Commander Valor is dealing with the orc problem and I have important information concerning it. I witnessed a meeting of the orc lords. The guard eyes you with interest and tries to judge whether you can be trusted. Finally, he stands up, opens a door and enters the room ahead of you. The commander looks up from his work. The guard repeats what you told him. Your information about the orcs could be useful. We have fought them back, but not yet defeated them. Come in. The commander listens attentively, and now and then asks questions, as you tell him about the three orc armies and the meeting of the chieftains with the Alf Syntharas. This sounds very grave. I will send out messengers. We must be prepared. We must press on. Farewell, Commander Valor. Kill as many orcs as you can, dwarves. Palandi will be with you. You see a camp with a wagon and two people on the edge of the path. Behind them, Black Saddle towers up above a thick, dark forest, about a half a day's journey away. You don't want to give them a shock, so you address them while you are still a distance away. Hello, friends. Is there any space by your fire? The two traders look up and visibly jump when they see you three dwarves. Ah, hello. Ah, uh -huh. yes, of course. It doesn't escape your attention that you seem to be causing the traders some uneasiness, but you take up their offer and sit down. The twins follow your example. We're only travellers. We're looking for someone who's said to live on Black Saddle. A hermit. Someone who lives here? The traders exchange amazed looks. If they live here, they must be mad. Normally we wouldn't stop and rest here, but the horses are too exhausted. Our departure from Perista was delayed and we must have driven them too hard. You come from Perista? How are things there? No news to speak of, I'd say. Well, except for Nudin the Knowledge Lusty. You know Nudin the Knowledge Lusty. 
Lot Yonan introduced him to you many years ago during a visit. What about him? Oh, nothing really. Just rumours. You nod at the trader to continue. He's behaving strangely and disappears into his tower for days on end. And he looks ill, apparently. Well, that's what someone I know said. Perhaps he got a spell wrong. Later in the night, after eating together and some friendly conversation by the campfire, you all decide to sleep, but you take the first watch. It's a night in which nothing happens, and the next morning the traders set off early. After breakfast, you also continue on your journey. After a march through the thick pine forest, Black Saddle, the sinister tabletop mountain, and your journey's destination rises up before you. I can only climb a little way here. Oh, there must be a better way. An old tree. Looks like it could fall down at any moment. There we go. Too steep. I can't get a grip anywhere. I should be able to get up here. Oh. Oh. That was close. I hope this is all worth it. Definitely a rock face. There's something engraved on it. You realize with surprise that they are runes in the dwarven language. Huh? Um, hello? Master Garen? Lot Yonan sent me to bring some items back to you. My inquiries are almost at an end. That means I can finally go to be with my sunshine. I have never been to Greenglade, but I think I will like it there. I deposited my most valuable things in the grave of Horengarth before my departure and secured it with magic. The password is... You recognize the following words as rune names, but they're written in the learned language, so you don't know which they are. <sighs> Greenglade. Oh, great.
So, Scholar, what are the results of your inquiries? There is an abandoned fortress in the mountain, and I think it belonged to the Thirdlings. Boindil's eyes narrow. The blasted dwarf killers! A Thirdling fortress? Here? In the middle of Girdleguard? We must let High King Gundrabur know about this. The fortress has been long abandoned by the looks of it. Anyway, I can't go to Ogre's death until I have completed my quest. Goren is in Greenglade. Huh. The High King, why do you want to bring me to him? <sighs> All right then. It's about the choice of the new High King. Dandagar, the King of the Fourthlings, is with his entourage in Ogre's death and is supposed to ascend the throne. But our acting High King Gundrabur wants to prevent that from happening. He fears that Gandagar wishes to instigate a war against the Elves. But what have I got to do with that? Boindil is about to say something, but is silenced by a nudge in the side from his brother. High King Gundrabur will explain everything when the time comes. You look distrustfully from one twin to the other. Boindil has donned an innocent expression, and Boendal doesn't give you the impression that he has anything else to say on the matter. What does this King Gandagar have against the Elves? Dwarves and Elves just don't get along. Brachus and Satalia made us that way. I know that, but, but going to war for just that after all this time? Well, there must be more behind it. They say that the King of the Fourthlings is full of hatred and is a hothead in this matter. Whatever, your High King must wait. I have a quest to carry out in Greenglade. But our quest is... Boindil raises a placatory hand and throws his rucksack onto his back in preparation. Let it be, dear brother. Look at him. He has made his decision, and you will not be able to change his stubborn dwarven mind. You can't help but smile. While taking a rest, you see a car trundling along the road not far away from you. A young couple are sitting on the box seat, clearly in love and more interested in each other than the rest of the world around them. The sight reminds you of a long, unanswered question. So, I was uh, wondering, what do female dwarves look like? Uh, pretty. Very pretty. Aha. Uh -huh. You were expecting a little more information. Uh, do they have beards? No. No, I would say it's more like... Like fluff. Oh, very attractive. And, uh, and what do they do? I mean, are they warriors too? In our kingdom, most take care of domestic life. They take the animals down to the meadows in the valleys, make sure the lard is a full and that there's plenty of good beer, and make our clothes. It only ever causes problems when men and women stand shoulder to shoulder in battle. Some of them are talented stonemasons and smiths, and beware of insulting their skills. They are no less proud than we are. By the evening campfire, Boindil rummages around in his rucksack and pulls out a cheese wrapped in a cloth. He sticks a fist-sized piece on a spit and grills it on the fire. Ah, there's nothing better than grilled cheese at the end of a long day. The smell it gives off makes you hold your breath. Oh, oh it smells like my socks after weeks of marching in my boots. Oh, picky, are you? Hardly surprising, considering you were brought up by humans. It's ruined your taste. Boindil holds the stinky cheese at the end of the stick under your nose. Eight. And stop complaining. You pull the warm piece of cheese from the stick. It tastes dreadful. Your fingers will smell of it for the next few days, and probably your mouth will too.
Ah, so we meet again, dear dwarf. Tungdil, wasn't it? Interested in buying something? You say goodbye to the traders and continue your journey. The closer you get to Parista, the livelier the streets become. Many of the large buildings in the city are even taller than the high city wall, but one building towers above them all, the palace. Its dome gleams white in the sun. It is the seat of the Council of Magi, and its central tower, which juts high into the sky, serves as a waypoint for travellers as far as fifty miles away. You reach the Council's palace, but are stopped in front of its gates by a guard. The Council of Magi is convened to take care of the Perish land. They mustn't be disturbed. The Perish land? You mean the barrier? Is there something wrong with it? The guard shrugs his shoulders. Won't be anything the Council can't sort out. You approach the village and can tell, even from far off, that something isn't right. The smell of burnt wood and death is in the air. By Vrakas, the piggies have really shown those pointy ears. We couldn't have done it any better. Stay alert. I want to find out what happened to Goren. Hoof prints. Burned into the ground. How far? The fire in Boindil's eyes flares up with delight. Huzzah! That would make a change from those stupid peggies. Did you hear that, brother? We might get to test our blades on Tion's pointy ears. The elf maiden's graceful snow-white face still radiates beauty in terrible contrast to the rest of her appearance. From the neck down, she is nothing more than a blood-red, damp and glistening skeleton. There are long nails sticking through her thin bones, and where her beautiful eyes once were are now gaping black holes. In your imagination, you see the Alphar Shadow Mare standing around the Lady of Greenglade, devouring her while she, nailed to the tree, squirms and screams in pain. You quickly put your hand over your mouth. You have read about the elves and their buildings. This here had always just been a small example of their architectural skill, which achieved perfection in Allendur, now burning and ruined, the pavilion makes an even sadder impression. Green Glade was one of the few places in Girdlegard where humans and elves live together. You don't see any elven features among all the faces contorted with pain and fear. You look away. The body of the man is riddled with arrows and is lying in a small patch of undamaged ground while a sea of flames must have raged in a circle around him. The robes remind you of those of Lot Yonan's famuli. This, plus the fact that the man used magic, makes you quite sure that this is Garen. Garen had these books on him when he was attacked. Was he trying to bring them to safety? Your eyes fall upon a sealed letter next to the books. The circumstances seem grave enough for you to break the seal. Greetings, Toga. I am glad to hear that you finally wish to confide in Lot Yonan. I have found out something new about the demon. It's all written in these books. I think they are the key to his destruction, or... I hope so, at least. Yours faithfully, Goren. What demon are they talking about? 
You instinctively think about how the magical barrier is only a few days' march north of here. And beyond it, Varakas only knows what kind of creatures live in the perish land. I knew I smelled the stench of groundlings. Huzzah! This will be fun! We finally get to fight! I hope your blood doesn't clot too much. It has to be nice and fluid for my fine brush strokes. Ha! Huh. How do you plan to defeat us, pointy ears? There are three of us. Oh, only three. That makes it easier. She looks over the corpses. Othar and Lueth Buanre! Oh, oh, what's happening? That's... the perished land. Impossible. Gr Greenglade is south of the barrier. I know of nothing else that can resurrect the dead. Knock their heads off or they'll keep coming back. Don't rush me! Huh? Yes? Yes? What is it? What is it? Huh? Oh, creature! Attack! Ha ha! Pow! Another one bites the dust! I'll be ready soon! Oh, you did it you very hard! Too easy! Huh? Yes? What is it? Huh? Yes? Uh-huh. Yes? Huh? We hardly put up a fight! And you goodbye forever! Ha ha! What is it? And again! What is it? Oh, oh, I didn't creature. hit you very hard! Yeah! Too uh -huh. easy! Huh? And what now? What is it? Who's next? Pleasure. Ah! What is it? Up a fight. Huh? Pow! Another one bites the dust. <laughs> Who's next? Oh, ah! what bad luck for you. Huh? Huh? We <laughs> hardly put up a fight. Yes? Uh-huh. Oh, oh, yes. you! Yes? What is it? I'll be ready what soon! We hardly put up a fight! Yes? yes? Huh? Too oh. easy! Yes? Oh, 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 bad luck for you! End Come it. here, you! Huh? Yes? Put up a fight. Hmm. 
Dwarves, you protected the glade. The perished land, the barrier has fallen. You can feel your stomach crumping. Unlike Boindil, you can't say a word. The damn mage, I only had one job! So this is what it is like to rise from the dead. I feel nothing. I am left with nothing. My love, my beauty, my home, and my forest. Everything has been taken from me. I beg you, have mercy and put an end to my suffering. Without even being able to look into her eyes, you recognize the sadness in the Elf Maiden's expression. The dignity that she must once have radiated can only be imagined in her current state. Karen was here, and I've heard that you elves have special abilities in battle. Did the Alpha take you by surprise in your sleep? I felt her presence, but when I confronted the elf, she had already killed the first of us and resurrected the perished land. It fills humans and dwarves with a hatred for life. It turns you into beasts. They charged through the village like a fury, and everyone that they killed became one of theirs. If the perished land spreads further south, then Nodon won't need any orcs, ogres, or Alfar. One human losing their life in the perished land oh, would be enough for the madness to sweep through the land like the plague. Your stomach turns, but you know that it's right. You've never seen the twins looking so serious. They would pit themselves against any army of orcs, but this is something beyond their power and yours. We need the Magi. They must rebuild the barrier. I can't believe it. The barrier has fallen. How, how could that happen? Who could tell? Anything could go wrong with all that hocus pocus. It had held back the perished land since the fall of the fifthlings. Reinforcing the barrier whenever it loses power is the primary duty of the great mage. I, I can't imagine how Nodon or anyone else could have broken through it. You think of the demons mentioned in Garen's letter. You wonder whether it could be possible that a demon from the Outer Lands might possess powers so great that even the Six Magi weren't ready for it. We must go to Lot Yonan before the Perish Land spreads further. He will know what is to be done. Neither of your companions objects. Every evening since you left Greenglade, you have looked at Goren's books and tried to prize out the knowledge that they hold. But now, you must admit to yourself that you can't decipher them. They are written in the learned language for High Magi, and Lot Yonan didn't teach you that. However, you're sure that the books are important. Why else would Goren want them sent to Turga the Fair-Faced? You put them away with a sigh, and your eyes remain on the bag that Lot Yonan gave you. Did Garen ask Lot Yonan to return the magical artifacts in the pouch? You pick up the pouch and look at it. Lot Yonan forbade me from opening the pouch. Lot Yonan trusted you with the pouch. You don't want to betray that trust. You look at it for a moment longer, but then you close the rucksack and pack it away. But your curiosity is not so easily contained and keeps you awake in the night.
Just like previous nights, you are haunted by the image of the elf maiden nailed to the tree in Greenglade. You wake from your sleep and look around you. The night is unusually dark. Despite your good dwarven eyes, you can only make out Boendal's outline, even though he is keeping watch only a few steps away. You are about to lie down again, but suddenly feel something cold against your throat. Next to you, the pale face of an elf slides into view. Good evening. I'm afraid we missed each other in Greenglade, so my companion had to receive you on her own. A colourful trader's wagon drawn by two stocky horses is coming towards you. A small man is sitting on the box seat, and as soon as he sees you, the wagon slows down. As it draws to a stop next to you, you realise that the driver isn't human. He's a dwarf. Greetings, my friends. All too rarely does one meet wayfaring dwarves around here. You can call me Mort. Greetings, Mort. I am Tungdil. This is Boindil and Boendal. You are happy to meet another dwarf, and such a friendly and eloquent one at that. Wayfaring dwarves may not be common, but a travelling dwarf trader? Now that really is weird. Then you see what great luck it is that we've met like this. Come, have a look at my wares. I'm sure you'll find something to make a dwarf's life a little sweeter. I'll make you a good price. Mort, I hope you don't mind me asking, but which kingdom are you from? The dwarf's clothes seem more like those of humans, and he isn't bearing any coat of arms. My kingdom? Is that important? I'm my own kingdom. I go where I please and enjoy the fresh air and the sun on me skin. At your side, Boindil is tensing his muscles, and you think you see from the corner of your eye his hands moving a little nearer to the handle of his axes. Is your kingdom important? You two must be secondlings, right? I can tell by your... armour. But you... He looks you over for a while. You're not a secondling, are you? As you yourself don't know for sure which kingdom you belong to, you give no answer and just shrug your shoulders. Mort throws you a knowing glance and nods slowly. Where are you heading? To Clintle, a small village where I can expect to do very little business. But the people there are nice and kind. I've known some of them since they were smaller than me. Isn't it astounding how much they manage to achieve in such short lives? After glancing at Boindil's grave expression, Mort continues unfazed. I can say in all certainty that there's not the same ambition to make a difference and change things in our halls. That is because there is no reason to change things if you do them right first time. We dwarves think first before acting. As it is Boindil of all people making such a claim, you're sure it must be a joke. But your friend continues to eye the trader with a serious and distrustful look. We must press on. It was a pleasure meeting you, Mort. Mort smiles. The feeling is mutual, Tungdil. Vrakas be with you. Mort spurs the horses on, and the colourful wagon jolts into motion. You shouldn't be so trusting. The wagon is no more than a few yards away when Boindil looks at you reproachfully. A dwarf who lives alone among humans for years on end and disowns his kingdom? Don't you know what that means? He's an outcast, Tungdil. His kingdom and his clan have banished him. It's a severe punishment, only dealt out for serious offences. The twins enter into a long discussion about what crime the trader may have committed and go on to teach you the basics of dwarven law. As dramatic as their accounts may be, you didn't have the impression that Mort was a criminal, nor that he suffered particularly from his exile. Boindil unwraps his dwarf cheese again and cooks it on the fire. When he offers you a piece, you take it. I knew we'd make a dwarf of you in the end. You chew on the cheese so you don't have to answer. It tastes better than you first thought.
You arrive at a small, bustling village. One thing is clearly missing from the lively scene, the sound of metal on metal from the village smithy that would normally be heard above everything else at this time of day. A dour, grim-looking man is sitting in front of the forge with his right arm in a sling. His expression brightens as he sees you, and he jumps to his feet. Dear dwarves, could I interest you in helping me in my workshop for a day? The man's expression is somewhere between desperation and hope. As you don't answer immediately, he continues. You will, of course, be royally rewarded for your work. I can offer you one hundred gold pieces. What happened to your arm? A stupid accident. A box of blanks fell down. I was trying to catch it. It will heal, fortunately, but I won't be able to wield my hammer for a while. You must have quite a backlog of work. You nod sympathetically. You always felt bad if you were ill or couldn't work in the forge for some reason or other. Loads. But if what I hear about the metal working skills of the dwarves is true, it will be easy for you to manage it in a day. I'll help you. I worked in a forge for a while. You modestly conceal that in this case, a while means almost a whole human lifetime. A little later, you are standing in the workshop, examining the smith's inferior tools, while he fires up the forge and prepares everything for the job, as well as he can, with just one good arm. You weren't able to persuade the twins to help you. As warriors, they'd rather go hunting, Boindil declared. But you think it's more probable that you'll find them drinking beer. But you don't care. You're excited about being able to smith again after such a long time. Hours later, you have forgotten everything around you. The heat of the forge, the sweat on your warm skin, the play of the flames. You're in your element, and work as if in a trance. The smith left the workshop ages ago, with a satisfied grin on his face. Oi, I'm talking to you. You look up in surprise. Everything but the beating of the hammer had ceased to exist, and you didn't notice that someone has come in. Can you do it? You immediately dislike the middle-aged man. He sounds you out so doggedly with his light grey eyes that it feels as though he wants to look right through you and into your deepest thoughts. The man points to two horses. Those two, in one hour. With the forge hammer in your hand, you play dumb. You blink and look back and forth between the horses and the man. What's the deal with the horses? You expect the man to fly off the handle, but you feel even more uneasy when he asks you quietly and very slowly to please re-shoe the two horses. These two need shoeing? No problem. The man doesn't look convinced, but you get to work with confidence. Two more armed men are standing next to the horses, sizing you up. So, you're mercenaries, I take it. You're only trying to engage in conversation, but the man looks at you incredulously, as if he didn't expect dwarves to be able to talk. Something like that. Got lots of work? Oh, do you know anything about the armies of orcs from the south? We can't complain. The man's tone makes it clear that the conversation has ended here. You carry out the work in silence. As the leader of the mercenaries pays you, you have the feeling that he is trying to transfix you with his eyes. The men leave the workshop without a word. You ignore the horsemen and concentrate on your work. When you tell the twins about your visitors later on, they know exactly who you're talking about. They encountered them on the way back from hunting. You spend the night in the smith's house and continue on your way with your well-earned reward the next morning.
Once you reach the top of the hill above Goodwater, you can see what is left of the village. The sea of red roof tiles has given way to a forest of burnt black ruins. You see a light through the tree some way from the path. It inevitably brings to mind your encounter with the woodcutters. Thinking about it, they do deserve it. Boindil grins widely, and before Boendal can stop him, he stomps off. You lie awake in your camp and think about the woodcutter's roast that you had for dinner. The rabbit was the best thing you've eaten in a long time. It tasted of victory. Why are the Magus's vaults here in the middle of nowhere? And... Why does the Lord of Yonandar live in a vault and not in a castle? It's to do with the magical fields that spread out under Girdlegard, so the five magical realms are found where the fields are at their strongest. And that's why he lives in the vaults? To be closer to the underground magic? No, it's uh, more to do with security. Two hundred students of magic and well, a source of almost unlimited magical energy... The Magus thought that an underground vault was a more suitable place to train than Master Nudin's tower in the middle of Parista. I don't like it here. All this hocus-pocus is bad news. Us dwarves know that and keep well away, just as Vrakus commanded. I hope you know that too. I cannot perform magic, and I've never attempted to. Nevertheless, please show respect. Remember that it was Lot Yonan who took me in and saved me. Now then, it would seem that the tongue of the learned one becomes somewhat haughtier, and his sentences doth wind most strangely as we verily approach the vaults. You can't help but grin guiltily. With a beseeching glance at the twins, you step into the area in front of the vaults. Seeing no one there you might greet, you and your companions enter your old home through the open gate. Who the hell built this tunnel? Boendal examines the crumbling roof with a mixture of disbelief and indignation. Be quiet. I want to surprise them. Is that such a good idea? Why if we give your master such a shock that he casts a spell on us? I don't want to be turned into a mouse or, or a bar of soap. It is unusually quiet in the vaults, but the smell of dinner is in the air. You imagine Frala looking up at you from her cooking pot in the kitchen and smiling. Ah, there's boiled and roasted meat for dinner. Come on. That's no reason to go and get ourselves turned into something weird. We'll stay here until you're finished with your little game. Lumps of meat rise up and appear on the brown, bubbling surface of the soup before sinking back down out of sight. The hearty smell makes your mouth water. Uh, uh, a human foot? Your stomach turns, and you have to fight hard against the impulse to run out of the kitchen screaming. What happened here? Speak! Ah, uh, another one. <laughs> Don't even think of using magic, or I'll lodge this pretty piece of steel in your brain. It takes a Famulus a few seconds to comprehend the situation he suddenly found himself in. 
He seems to weigh up his options for a moment before he breathes out and the tension leaves his body. All, all, all right, I won't use magic. Lot Yonan, where is he? Nodon killed him. He killed all of them in Parista. There's no one left in Girdleguard who can take on the last Magus. You're saying that someone took on all six of the Magi at once and defeated them? Ridiculous. Five Magi. My master Nudin is not on the Doublefold, the Lord of the Perished Land and soon to be Lord of Girdleguard. He killed the Masters and the Apprentices followed soon after. They're all gone and he changed the magic field so that only we can use them. An icy hand grabs your heart. It's impossible that there's only a single Magus left and he's not fighting against, but for the Perish Land. Why are you snooping around in Lot Yonan's study? What are you looking for? I'm looking for artifacts that Lot Yonan, when he was in Parista, claimed he had forgotten and left in a cupboard, and for the books that were stolen from Greenglade. I'm guessing you're the dwarves that stole the books. What does your master want with the artifacts and the books? I don't know. He commands, we obey. He, <laughs> he's going to be very displeased. I did find a bag in the cupboard, but it didn't contain the right objects. What happened here? Where is everyone? For a while. The Famulus seems to be playing with the idea of being stubborn. Boendal pushes a little harder on the end of the crow's beak, and the tip penetrates the skin. Blood seeps out. Ah! Oh, ah! Oh, they're, oh, they're... They're gone! Dead! A school full of magi destroyed without any signs of struggle? Lies! The facts seem stacked against it, but you cling on to this faint hope. Lot Yonan's Famuli were already in Parista. There were only novices left. We made easy work of them. The Elphar, Syntheras, he insisted on being part of the raid after he found out that you grew up here. He opened the gates and killed most of those here before they even knew what was happening. In your mind's eye, you see a pale face appearing from the darkness. You saw what Elphar are capable of in Greenglade, you push the thought to the back of your mind and try to keep a clear head. I've had enough of your lies. They're alive. Lot Yonan escaped and has gathered his apprentices, Frala, and the others around him to fight against Nodon. We just have to find them. <laughs> the war was over before you even noticed it had begun. Nodon cannot be stopped. He is on his way here and will just... Blah, blah. We will leave immediately. This news is of great importance to the Council of Dwarves. I'm not going anywhere. I have to find my friends and I... Orcs! Lots of them! Huh? Of course! Another one huh? bites the dust. What is it? Let me get the pillars. We could knock some of them. Huh? And oh, bad luck for I'm you one. now. Yes. Oh, you I'm working very hard. Oh, Come here, right. you. Out of my way. Don't rush me! Yes? Huh? Huh? Too easy! What is it? Ha ha! Huh? Yes? And here you are forever! Kill! I need help over here! Quickly! Ow! 
Another one for breakfast! Forever! And again! Who's next? He hardly put up a fight! Bad luck for you! I have Bowen Dog! Give me a hand! Huh? Haha! Yes! Huh? Yes? What is it? Who's next? Huh? And you the body forever! Come here, you! you. Uh -huh. There are too many of them! The side door in the workshop. It's our only chance. Oh, he didn't hit you very hard! Yes? Let's go ahead! Of course! Get out of my way! I'm going to get out of my way! Damn. The first 20 are mine! You have come far, but this is far enough. Give me the artifacts and the books you stole in Greenglade, and I'll set you free. What's with the artifacts and the books? They belong to me. Lotionan was supposed to bring them to Porista, but forgot them. So, I came to pick them up. That's all you need to know. What have you done to the other Magi? Your Famulus told us some cock and bull story about you forcing them and their Famuli to go to Porista, and then murdering them. I did what had to be done to protect Girdleguard. I wish there had been another way. But they would never have understood. Do your eyes deceive you, or do you really see a brief moment of real regret on the swollen face of the Magus? You wanting my rucksack is enough reason for me not to give it to you. I don't need your consent. Look after the rucksack. If you lose it, you will also lose your life. Go back to your realm, dwarves, and let your king know that I need his land. Either he hands it over without a drop of blood being spilt, or my troops and allies take it by force. You can take this one with you. I have no use for him. <laughs> Invisible wizard, my ass. Look. Let me handle her. Kill the dwarves. The the rock. There's the orc with the rucksack. Let's get him. Yes, as uh, good as. Oh. Ready soon! 
Let's get out of here! Over the bridge! What is it? That's good oh, On oh, my yeah. way! Don't rush me! Avoid that! And I didn't even take off That's my horse! Avoid you! On yes, my sir. way! Oh, of course! As we should have done! Don't rush me! Out of my way! No chance. Oh, oh, oh. I'll be ready soon! Out of my way! Let's get out of here! Retreat? We should fight on! We would die! Perhaps you've noticed that Nodon has risen again, headless? He is more powerful than the Perish Land itself, but the key to his destruction is in here. We will return to the Secondlings and tell them what the Magus is up to. We'll be safe at Ogre's death, and there we can hatch a plan. If we manage to get there, Nod On will do anything to stop us. Then let him try! Was fun. What's next? Boindil looks at you, and the sparkle in his eyes goes out. We are both very sorry about what happened here, Tungdil. You told me, Synthrasa. I convinced myself that you gulp and turn away from your friends. That's what I call a goodly challenge. Cover me. Not a good idea if you want to go on living, dwarf. You've got quite a big mouth for someone who sounds like a girl. You are Andakai, the Tempestuous, right? Correct. And you are Tungdil, Lot Yonan's charge. Your companion, won't he sit with us and introduce himself? Yes! Hey! You up there! Can you even hear us with that bucket on your head? Jeroen is mute, and he won't do you any harm unless I command him to. And as long as you treat him with courtesy, dwarf. Boindil seems to briefly weigh up his chances against the two of them. I decide when I'm courteous. Just don't get in my way. And the orcs are mine! Honorable Mager, what news of Lot Yonan? Does he live? Andakai looks at you in silence, pain and rage slowly spreading across her face. He is dead, Tungdil, along with Myra, Turga, and Sabora. Nod On killed them all and destroyed the Council of Magi. The certainty of their death is painful. It feels as though someone has just torn your insides out. He killed their best pupils, too. And now he's the unchallenged Magus in Girdleguard. It was you, wasn't it, that attacked them with the lightning? Were you any more successful than we were? Andakai shakes her head. He defied everything I threw at him. All of my skills. In vain. I soon realized he was superior to me, but I wanted to buy you some time. What happened? How could he defeat the Council of Magi? Nudin called us to Parista, under the guise of reinforcing the barrier against the perished land. Instead, he tricked us, took control of most of our powers and attacked us. I cut him down with my sword, but he rose again and impaled me with his staff. All I can remember after that is the sound of fighting, destruction, and cries of death. How did you survive? 
Jerun. Nudin had forgotten he was with me in Parista. He found me, tended to my wounds and brought me out of the city to safety until I could summon up enough power to heal myself. And Lot Yonan? When Jerun carried me away, he was frozen in stone, like a statue. To my knowledge, the spell cannot be reversed. You nod slowly. You don't have the strength to say anything else right now. Nodon's Famula said that he had changed the magical fields, but you still seem to be able to use them. Andakai smiles. I'm not quite as benevolent as the other Magi. My god Samusin is the god of balance. He loves the darkness as much as the light, which means I can use both. But my powers aren't unlimited. It is difficult for me to store and use this altered magic. We should avoid confrontation as much as possible. What will you do now? Leave this place. I'm not so foolish as to believe that I could restrain the perished land or nod on. Why should I stay here? Foolish, no! <laughs> but cowardly! You're on your way to the Kingdom of the Secondlings, right? Then I will accompany you and leave Girdleguard by the High Pass. We'll need all the help we can get. Nodon will have a lot worse in store for us than just orcs. The Mager nods in agreement. Then she looks pensively at your rucksack. Your rucksack? Why did Nodon want it? I... I was taking some objects to Goren, one of Lot Yonan's family. He was murdered at Greenglade by an elf. There were books lying next to his body, which he was planning to send to Turga the Fairfaced. May I see them? You nod. Take the books out of your rucksack and hand them to her. She goes through the letter and the books, one after another, without showing any sign of emotion. Finally, she closes the last of the books. Is that all? They are only sagas and travelogues from the Outer Lands, which tell of legendary creatures and myths. I don't know why they should be of interest to nod on. There must be something in them that's important to him. He destroyed a whole village for them, and... and the vaults. Possibly. I'll study the books. But let's sleep now. Jerun can keep watch. We are still being followed. It would seem that one of the armies who've been following you since Lot Yonan's vaults has caught up with you. You can even smell the rancid grease the orcs use on their weapons. Boindil immediately prepares to fight, but Andakai demands you avoid confrontation. If we get caught up in a fight, they will surround us. The way southwards is more or less clear. You agree with the Mega. You decide to march through the night to increase the distance between you and them. The forced march is strenuous, but you manage to evade the army of orcs. You have put out a plate of food for the night every evening since Jerun and Andakai joined you on your journey but still none of you have seen him eat. You decide to pay particular attention to him this evening to try and find out what is under the helmet. Andakai is sitting not far from the giant, studying the books. Have you found anything useful yet? She looks up at you. You think I will stay and fight if there is a spell in the books that might defeat Nodon? Yours is the god of balance. Don't you see it as your duty to create a balance between light and dark? Instead of answering, Andakai rubs her eyes and closes the books. It's too dark to study. Let's see what tomorrow brings. Disgruntled, you watch the Mega as she walks over to her bed for the night. Your eyes fall upon Jerun and the plate at his feet, on which not a crumb of food is left. The army is too big for you. And even if you could defeat them, the battle would take up too much time. 
so you decide to march through the night to increase the distance between you and them. The forced march is strenuous, but you manage to evade the horde. In the afternoon, with the sun low in the sky, the path leads you through a ravine. A glance at your map suggests that you're near to Boribor, the Orc realm. Fracas, may we remain unscathed. About a mile further on, Boindil suddenly stops in his tracks and sniffs. Can you smell that? Piggy snouts! And lots of them too! Let's proceed with caution. Perhaps we can take a few of them out before they raise the alarm. Up there! We have to stop them before they can warn anyone! What is it? He hardly put up a fight. Now you've got me interested. Oh, you didn't hit me very it? hard. I'll tell you when I'm ready. Too easy. The magic takes time. Interested. He hardly put up a fight! Aye. Too easy! I need help over here! Oh. Hey. What is it? We're at the leisure. I have Bonda! Give me a hand! Another one bites the dust! Ah. Now you've got me interested. Too easy! Oh, I'll wait, you! Oh. Oh. Luck for you! What a waste of time! Now you've got me interested. Of course! 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 Of 
Hey! Yes. Another one bites the dust. Huh? Oh, yeah. Bad luck for you. Die forever. Yeah! I have Bonda! Give me a hand! Yeah. What is it? We should go down into the caves and vaults. <laughs> There'll be more of them down there. Or maybe we should concentrate on finally getting to Ogre's Death Stronghold, Boindil. You ignore the offended look on your friend's face and set off, leaving the Orc Mountains behind you. You can already see the oasis a day's journey away, but in the glimmer of the midday sun, you're not sure whether it might not just be a mirage. But the twins are convinced that there is a village here, and the prospect of a roof over your heads for the night keeps you going. The nearer you get to the oasis, the more the uneasy feeling grows that something's not right. It's too quiet, and you don't see any movement. Once you enter the village, your fears are confirmed. Your enemies have already been here. I'm telling you, it's a trap. If it is, then we'll soon find out. This whole thing is probably a trap. We should... Welcome to Pasna. I'm sure the citizens would greet you themselves, if they could. You recognize the Alf immediately. You saw him with the leaders of the Orcs, and he appeared to you in a dream after Greenglade. Or no, not in a dream. Synthras. So we meet again, Tangdil. What do you think of my work in the vaults? It was a nice start, wasn't it? An eerie smile sets on Synthras's lips. Wonderful! I can see the hatred in your eyes. Come on. Come and get your revenge. Huh? Oh, my oh, God. Luck for you! Now you've got me interested. Yes. Easy. What a waste of time. Huh? No chance. Yes. What is it? Uh. Oh, you didn't take it very hard. Huzzah! And I didn't even take off my gloves. Ow! Another one bites the dust. Oh, this is on my way. As good as done. All right. End it, pleasure. They're hitting me pretty hard. What is it? As I'm good as done. Don't rush me. I'll be ready soon. You're very I can't hard. Do that yet. What is it? Pow! Huh? Another one bites the dust. Yes. Don't rush me. Oh, he didn't hit you very hard! Too easy! Alright! 
What is it? I'll be ready soon. Huh? Don't rush me. Oh, what bad luck for you. I didn't hit you very hard. Yes? What is it? With pleasure. I didn't hit you very hard! As good as done! All right! What is it? All right! Oh, what bad luck for you! On my way! As good as done! Say goodbye forever! Don't rush me! I didn't hit you very hard! With pleasure! On my way! Retreat! Back! Why are you here? And how can you... Possibly still use magic. The one person your master left living is the one you would least like to have as an enemy. Go on, little Alf. Flee. Your magic saved you this time. But next time, I'll be prepared. I've had enough of fighting. It's about time we head to your home. Oh, we've had enough too, but we've got several days in the desert ahead of us before we can enjoy a cold beer. The longer we talk about it, the later we'll get to our beer. Let's go. You've been traveling through the desert for days. The sand is simply everywhere. In your shoes, under your clothes, in your mouths. Even the makeshift cloths that you've wrapped around your heads is of little help. With the last of the energy you can muster, you finally leave the 40 mile wide sandbar that separated you from Ogre's death. It is as if you've passed through an invisible wall when the raging wind and sand suddenly fall silent. In front of you, an enormous massive towers into the sky, the Blue Range. The slopes cast long shadows over Ogre's Death Fortress, which nestles in the spurs of the mountain. Even from this distance it looks impressive, with its four defensive terraces, one above the other. The anticipation of entering a real dwarven city for the first time grows with every step, and you feel the power returning to your limbs. You've almost done it. My High King, you have called me to succeed you to the throne. Here I stand before you. Well... <coughs> Before you are chosen as the successor to the High King, here, King Gandagar, the challenges that await you. Hordes of orcs are rampaging through the north and the west, and the perished land is stirring. It would seem that the Magi cannot sustain the barriers. This gives us an excellent opportunity to attack the last elves in Alandur. They are weakened. The perished land afflicts them. Let us wipe out the traitors once and for all. Yes, right. Exactly. Mm. Here, here. Madness. What are you talking about? I do not recognize you, King Gandagar, in what you are saying. The elves are inhabitants of Girdlegard. 
Has your hatred for them clouded your senses to the point that you wish to ignore the words of our god? Belendolin's gaze falls, as if incidentally, on the king of the fourthling's advisor. Or is someone giving you bad advice? On the contrary. It was Bislipper who finally supplied me with the proof. A report titled How the Fifflings Lost the Gate. It was the elves that poisoned the brave Fiffling warriors in their stronghold. A devious disease spread by the pointy ears in the shafts of the Grey Range. Impossible! Oh, I always knew it! Treason! I don't believe that. They should that. pay for Just it! Just to the pointy ears! Enough! Don't be so short-sighted! We are talking about the safety of Girdle Guard. We must reach out and forge a large coalition with the Elves. Yes, and even with the Thirdlings, if we are to defeat the perished land. My High King, you cannot be serious. Drivel from a dwarf who has grown too old in his post. Are we not here to choose a new High King? We have waited long enough. It would seem you will have to wait a little bit longer. The second aspirant has arrived. Our guests must be tired from their long journey. The meeting is adjourned till tomorrow. But why do you think that I... Everything will become clear. I've had a room prepared for you. Before you take to your bed, please pay the High King and I a visit in the throne room. Your Highness! Heir apparent? What do you know? Spit it out. A slight expression of guilt flits briefly across Boindil's face, but he's soon back to his old self. A scholar as I king has something to it. You'll certainly have our votes, that's for sure. Boendal nods in agreement. As High King? You could unite the kingdoms, and get them to do battle against Nod On. You look at your friends and aren't really sure whether they are trying to pull your leg or not. I... I... I, I can't be High King. I, I... I got all my knowledge from... from... from books and... and... you... You're... Uh, you're pulling my leg, right? The twins' grins grow ever wider, and it would seem they can hardly contain themselves. <laughs> Just talk to High King Gundrabur and Belendolin. They will explain everything. For the first time you have the chance to appreciate the beauty of the place. You suddenly forget what you wanted to say. I've never seen such masterful masonry. To be honest, I didn't even know that stone could be worked in such a way. Ha ha ha! The secondlings are the best masons of all the kingdoms! That's how Fracas made us. Well, he made some of us into warriors, too. Boendal glances at his brother, and he laughs with satisfaction while looking around the hall himself. High King Gundrabur seems... well... Old? He is ancient! Even by Dwarvish standards! He has been old for as long as I can remember. Belendolin has taken care of most matters for dozens of cycles. But Gundrabur always has the final word. <laughs> His mind is younger than all of ours, I tell ya. Belendolin should become High King. I was there when a runt took his arm. He still managed to kill half a dozen of them afterwards. 
What fighting spirit? We had to drag him off the battlefield. The law requires that a firstling or a fourthling must be chosen as the new king of all dwarves. And as the firstlings didn't turn up, I think I'll continue to look around. Don't get lost. And tonight we will finally drink a lovely dark ale in the glowing anvil. Andekai, what is it? I came to return these books to you, Tungdil. Luckily, I was able to make sense of most of it. You observed how the Mega took time to study the books during your escape. They are records from the Outer Lands. They tell of demonic beings from Barren Ground who can take possession of humans and invest them with great power. Immortality, for example? The Mega nods seriously. They speak of an axe forged by the Undergrounders called Keenfire. It is said to have the power to cut through the flesh and bone of the living and completely destroy the demonic spirit deep within their soul. Do you know these Undergrounders? I have never heard of the Undergrounders, but I've been to the Outer Lands before. It must be terrible. The hordes of Teon have marched from there against our strongholds for thousands of years. It's not as bad as you think. It is certainly safer than a land in which a Magus possessed by a demon is on the loose. So you think a demon from the Outer Lands has taken possession of Nudin? He looked very different when I encountered him in Parista, and he rose from the dead even though you cut off his head. That can't be explained purely through the power of the perished land. And he wanted to prevent these books from falling into our hands, that would only make sense if Keenfire had the power to defeat him. Where is this Keenfire? I don't know if this weapon was ever forged. It requires rare materials and masterful craftsmanship. The purest, harder steel, stone barbs decorated with runes, a hilt of Sigurdaisy wood, inlays made of all the noble metals, the blades studded with diamonds, smithed in the hottest forge. We are dwarves. We have the most talented craftsmen. And you have the Sigurdaisy wood. It is amongst the objects in your rucksack, which is fortunate as there are no more Sigurdaisies in Girdelgard. But even if you manage to forge the axe, it might all be just a fairy tale. It's too little to wager our lives on. We can get all the missing materials, as well as a gem cutter, here in the stronghold. After all, Gandagar and his fourthlings are here. A stonemason from the secondlings, and I can smith. The Mager looks at you thoughtfully, and for a short time it seems as though your enthusiasm is rubbing off on her. But then she says, I wish you good luck, Tungdil. You still want to leave Girdelgard, but, but what will happen to your realm and, and all the other realms? I admire your optimism, my friend, but it isn't wise to stand in the way of a rolling stone. I don't wish to give up my realm but I would only be prolonging the suffering unnecessarily. But... You don't want to let the last Mager in Girdelgard go. Unfortunately, you can't think of anything that could cause her to stay. Many thanks, Honorable Mager, for all that you have done. A variety of cheeses, pickled cave mushrooms, toasted vault moss, and some smoked sausage. Mm. The intense smell of the cheese makes your mouth begin to water. You are exhausted from your adventurous journey, but it would be impolite to just go to bed if the High King is waiting for you. Come closer. The power that the old High King radiated when he called the Assembly to order has drained away from him. His body is sunken in the throne, but his eyes are alert and interested as he looks at you. The lost son returns to his people. Thank Vrakus. Tell us what you learned on your journey. You describe your adventure down to the smallest detail. Neither the King nor his advisor interrupts you. From time to time they nod, as though they were already aware of certain facts. 
their brows become more furrowed with every passing minute. When you are finished with your story, you also have some questions. I don't want to appear ungrateful, I, and I'm happy to finally be among my people, but, but I will not ascend the throne. I hardly know anything about our customs and laws. Everything that I know, I have learned from books that Lot Yonan gave me. There must be more suitable heirs than me. Your renouncement honours you. But to be honest, you never had a claim. To stop Gandagar, we had to stall for time. Lot Yonan helped us with our little story. We don't even know if you are a fourth thing. The King's advisor misinterprets your unbelieving gaze and quickly adds... Uh, we're only being as deceitful as goblins for one solitary reason. To stave off possible harm to our people. You feel as though you've been hit in the stomach. If this is true, not only have you lost your newly found kingdom, but Master Lot Yonan also didn't see it as necessary to inaugurate you in the conspiracy. What game is being played here? Gandagar as King of the Fourthlings is to supersede me as High King, but his mind is poisoned with hatred towards the Elves. He would probably win a war against them, but he would weaken us, and Girdelgard would not be helped by this. I was hoping for a great coalition with the Elves, and even with the Thirdlings. I would have given anything to start the negotiations. In times of great need, only the common goal can count. And which role have you planned for me? Well, with you as a second aspirant, certain possibilities of protocol open up to us. Why is Gandagar so full of hatred towards the elves? His father and brother were murdered by elves. At least that's what's claimed. No one knows the truth. Just as no one knows how true this report about the Fifthlings is. But isn't it strange that this letter has turned up now, just when it can play into the hands of the elf haters? Many dwarves' hatred towards the elves is great, perhaps even greater than their honesty. I understand why you want to prevent a High King Gandagar. You will be blind to our real problems. Gandagar's only liability is that he lets Bislipper whisper dark thoughts in his ear. The advisor is the problem, not the king. A problem that I am fortunate enough not to have. The High King smiles weakly at his advisor. Gandagar is a good dwarf and a good king, and I am certain he could also be a good High King if he was free of Bislipper's lies and false advice. Your plan has a flaw. Even if I were to light up, I couldn't win. No one on the council will vote for me. You don't have to win. Belendolin points to the Steelys in the throne room. It's written in our laws that the High King can oppose an heir if he isn't elected unanimously. He can then demand a duel or a contest in order to determine the winner. Such a contest could take weeks, if not months. And it would win us some time. What kind of contest would you have us compete in? Gandagar is surely superior to me in many things. Everyone in the council will write a task on a piece of paper, and from them the contest will be drawn. And this only once you have made a speech, and have won over as many as possible in the council to your side. The more sympathetic the council is towards you, the higher the chances of a contest that fits your abilities. Speech? You're beginning to like this whole thing less and less. Is this really the best for our people? If you cannot dissuade Gandagar from carrying out his plans, it could end in a fraternal war. Don't worry. We'll open up his eyes and he will recognize the malice of his feigned friend. We just need time, and you must gain it for us. 
I'm not sure. What if it goes wrong and we split the dwarves into two factions? We won't let it get that far. But you, Tungdil, will have to help us. We will support you with all our power. You will not take this road on your own. All right then. If you believe in it, I will follow your plan. No one acts more honorably than you, Tungdil. Belendalin smiles at you encouragingly. You say Andakai may have found a way to defeat Nodon. And she suspects that the Magus is possessed by a demon from the Outer Lands. It may be possible to kill this demon with an axe called Keenfire. I have commissioned armor that is worthy of a prince. It will be delivered to your chamber by sunrise. You say goodbye with a queasy feeling in your stomach. You always thought that you were articulate, but the prospect of having to make a speech in front of the large council doesn't exactly fill you with elation. The coal fire is lit when the kingdoms meet for council. It has lain dormant much too long, until it was finally lit again a few days ago. Ah, Tungdil, what is it? The High King and his advisor don't know where I come from either. But they only want to use me to delay Gandagar's coronation and ultimately prevent war with the elves. Whatever happens, we will stand by your side, Scholar. You're not sure whether the moral support of your friends will be much use in a contest with Gandagar, but it feels good not having to go through the whole thing on your own. Andakai deciphered what was written in the books that Garen wanted to send to Turga the Fairfaced. They tell of a demonic threat from the Outer Lands and how it can be stopped. Nudin cannot be killed by normal weapons, but Undergrounders have developed a weapon that might be able to do it. Keenfire. Undergrounders? What's that supposed to mean? You shrug your shoulders. Maybe there are dwarves in the Outlands too. Either way, they have described how this magical weapon can be made. If it's got anything to do with magic, the weapon cannot be dwarfish. We shouldn't go anywhere near it. Nudin fears the books. I believe that Keenfire is our best chance of stopping him. I think I'll continue to look around. Don't get lost. And tonight, we will finally drink a lovely dark ale in the glowing anvil. You are looking forward to the first proper bed for weeks. You undress and lie down. Before you know it, your eyes close and you fall asleep. When your new armor is brought to you the next morning, you can hardly believe your eyes. However, as a smith, you can't stand the fact that you haven't contributed anything to it and decide to add some inlays. Even one who wears the armor of a prince can still be a farrier underneath it, don't you think, Tungdil Bolifar? Just like a snake in elegant clothing is still a snake. Ignoring your question, Bislipur eyes you very exactly before he speaks. So, you want to be one of our kingdom? A foundling brought up by a wizard? One wouldn't think it possible. And I don't think it possible either. There is no proof of your origin and Gandagar the council on his side. Why don't you spare yourself the disgrace and just not turn up in front of the council? Put your skiing to bed, 
and we will take you into our kingdom. We will give you everything you need your whole life long. In exchange, you support Gandagard instead of challenging him. Proof! Oh, you mean like your letter that has been found after a thousand cycles and makes the elves responsible for the fall of the fifthlings? It is no secret that the elves are deceitful. And what could possibly be more suited to get one over on us than letting the perished land in and presenting us as the scapegoat? The elves have been displaced by the perished land and are now almost eradicated. I said they are deceitful, not wise. And what if I don't withdraw my candidacy? You wish to stand against your own king? A stray dwarf offending a deserving leader such as Gandagar through his claim? No one in the Brown Range will like that. Prepare yourself for life as an outsider among the Fourthlings. Children of the Smith cannot be silenced. You are the dwarf, I confess, but no fourthling can remember a dwarf child ever going missing. And you know thousands of the fourthlings personally, and know exactly where they live in the mountains, what they're planning, or what small tragedies take place in their lives? You have a sense that all the long evenings in the library and debating with Lot Yonan weren't for nothing, as Bislipper struggles for a reply, then lets it go. <laughs> You have had enough of this dwarf. He makes you feel uneasy, or worse still. Get out! A humanized bastard will not issue me orders. Know your place, false dwarf. The armor has been made by a master. Over the chainmail is steel plate, alloyed with gold in many places, which certainly appeals to you. There are also several decorative elements made of stone to honor its origin in the kingdom of the best stonemasons. You had just finished setting the last inlay, the seal of Lot Yonan, who brought you up and is gone, when Bislipper interrupted you. That is why I, too, lodge a claim to the throne, and why I think I am the more capable heir. Thank you for your speech, Tundil Bolifar. The Council may now ask questions. Yes, the Dwarf from the Second Link Kingdom over there. You say that a war against the Elves would be madness. But how can such a young dwarf as you judge that? <laughs> You've hardly seen anything of the world, has he? It is true. There is much that I only know from books. But it is written that it is our duty to defend and protect Girdlegard, and that includes the elves. And don't the elves have the same enemy as we do? They could stand by us in battle. Why should we play into the hands of the enemy by attacking them rather than working against the enemy together? That is true. He's right. The words of a clever warrior. But the point he is hates us and we hate them too. What is it they say again? My enemy's enemy is my friend. Yes, your question? Just so I get this right, you want to forge a weapon that is described in a book of fairy tales from the perished land to kill a demon that none of us has ever seen? I have most definitely seen it, Goingar, yellow belly shimmer beard. <laughs> <laughs> we have seen the perished land with our own eyes. And its master, Nodon, could not be killed. Many have died for the books in which it is written how keen fire can be made. 
and the Magus did all he could to get his hands on the two halves made of Sigurd Daisy wood. Those are the facts, whether you like them or not. These problems won't solve themselves, so I ask you, is it the Dwarven way to step aside and do nothing, or is it our way to act? To act! Uh, we don't hide away! If the humans won't stop the parish land, then we will! We shouldn't get drawn in! Let's show the Magus the strength of the Dwarves! Bislopper? Nothing you say will convince anyone here! You didn't grow up amongst us, and no one knows if you really are a fourthling. I do not believe there has ever been a more unworthy heir to the throne of the High King. You are just wasting our time. Oh, I didn't know you were the spokesperson for everyone at this assembly, Bisloper. I had the impression that every dwarf is capable of forming their own opinion. Absolutely. <laughs> hear, hear! He's right, you know. Keep out of it, Bisloper. I have heard enough. The Council has heard the words of both candidates and must now make its decision. Those of you who wish to see Tungdil Bolifar, the returning son from the Fourthling Kingdom, as my successor, raise your axe. And those who wish to see Gandagar Silverbeard from the Silverbeards, the King of the Fourthlings, as my successor. It's close, but Gandagar has received more votes. Very good. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Excellent! Here's to Gandagar! Long live our new High King! However, the result was not unanimous, and as acting High King, I avail myself of my right to demand a contest between the aspirants. What is this? But he won the ballot. It's the rules. The High King has the right to do so. Respect! He is still the High King. Silence! You have heard the High King's command. Write down your challenge for the aspirants. Are you ready? The one that masters this task first will become the High King. It is... an expedition. The trial is to lead a group to forge the axe Keenfire in the Grey Range, which can then be used to fight against the Magus Nod On. Ah... An expedition into the perished land? Ha <laughs> ha! Brilliant! You can't be serious. That's what I call a worthy challenge, don't you think? I call it luck, Scholar. Of all the challenges, Bislapur draws this one. <laughs> yes, luck. But, my king, don't demand this of me. Why me, of all people? You are one of my best gem cutters, and I promise to support him. It should be a fair contest. Or should I break my word just because of you? But... You will go, Goimgar Shibabeard. Do not put us to shame. Follow Tungdil's instructions. Go! And come back in good health. And with that, our group is complete. Who have you chosen as Mason? Good day, gentlemen. Bavragar? The old drunkard? Old drunkard? He assured me he's the best stonemason here. The High King himself sent him. Well, I said I was precisely the stonemason you need. I didn't exactly say I was sent by the High King. You let yourself be tricked by a drunkard. I don't want him with us. Rest assured, Boindil, I too could imagine better company. But Tungdil gave me his word. Yes, I gave you my word. 
And as long as you are capable of doing the stonework needed for Keenfire, you are welcome. Girdle Guard is at stake here. I wish you no ill fortune, Tungdil. But also, no good fortune. The throne belongs to me. And through my victory, Vrakus will show the clans. The task is clear to the contenders? The first to forge Keenfire and bring it back here has proven his abilities and will be our new High King to lead us in battle against Nod On. It will take months to complete the task. The journey to the Fiflings alone is a long and dangerous business. Dangerous, yes, but not necessarily long. Do you know the old tunnel system that connects the Dwarven Kingdoms? Tunnels are all well and good, but why should we get there so much quicker under the ground than over it? A knowing smile plays on the mouth of the advisor. Well... Pretty impressive what our forefathers achieved here, isn't it? The kingdoms all work together. If we do the same, nothing is impossible. Here, here. I still don't understand why you tricked me and why you were so set on coming with us. I have been the master of stone for more than 200 sun cycles. My work is admired all over Girdlegard. There has never been a better secondling mason than me. But today? I don't want to be remembered as a drunkard with the chisel trembling in my hand, but as Bavragor Amethyst, undefeated master of stone who brought keen fire to life. One last masterpiece. I... I hope you understand me asking, but there seems to be bad blood between you and Boindil. It's nothing that will endanger our mission. We've just always hated each other. There's more behind it than commonplace hatred. Bavragor doesn't react. His gaze is directed towards events that took place a long time ago. You really should rein in your drinking. We need you in good shape. There are some who say I'm only the master of beer and not the master of stone anymore. But don't worry. I haven't forgotten. I can't forget. No matter how much I drink. Hmm. I wonder why we haven't seen any sign of Gandagar recently. Perhaps they took a wrong turn somewhere. I'm sure we'll reach the Fifthling Kingdom before them. We're not on the way to the Fifthlings. We are on the way to the Firstlings. We're probably already under the land of the Custodian. The Firstlings? Why? The Firstlings have been the best smiths in Girdleguard since the Fifthlings were wiped out. Only they can alloy Teonium and Palandium, which are actually mutually repellent. Anyway, we could use all the help we can get in the battle against Nodon and... Goimgar! It burns! We won't get further this way, Scholar! What now? It's all your fault, you imposter! I was nearly killed, and for what? It is good that you are still alive. We need you for our mission. So you can steal a throne that doesn't belong to you? Hatred glints in the gem cutter's eyes, and for a moment, you think he's going to attack you with the courage of desperation. I'm not interested in the title of High King. I am trying to save Girdleguard. Even if you don't believe anything else, you must believe this. 
I don't have to believe anything. I am here against my will. My own thoughts are my only remaining right. Enough! Gather up all the materials we can still save. If we manage to reach the Firstlings, we can get anything we're missing there. And it should be less than 200 miles to their stronghold. After you have gathered together the materials, you begin to search for a way out. And after a sweaty climb, you reach a door adorned with runes. From here, you enter a large cave with a waterfall covering a sun-drenched opening. You walk through the waterfall one after another, and after the unintentional shower, you find yourselves in Weyan, near the enchanted realm of Oromyra. You find yourselves on a plateau, and the river which falls as a waterfall here hides the entrance to the underground rail network. It then flows past a forest, behind which you can see a wall and tiled roofs. You check the map. That must be Mifidania. We'll go through the forest to the city and see if we can refresh our supplies and buy some ponies. Boindil strikes up song during your hike. A short while later, Bavrigor joins in. But rather than actually singing along, he tries to outdo Boindil with his own songs. When he finally strikes up a love song, Boindil becomes absolutely livid. You take the stonemason to one side and ask him if he's doing it on purpose. Of course I'm doing it on purpose. I'm gonna make him suffer the whole journey. It can't go on like this. We can't fight amongst ourselves and save Girdleguard. You take a short break before you dare breach the roots of the problem. It's to do with a woman, right? Not in the way you might think. Smeralda was my sister. A young thing of only forty cycles. Bavrigor takes a large swig of his liquor before he continues. She was almost as belligerent as Boindil, and she got it into her blockhead to stand by him in battle. A bad decision. You can see the pain he is suffering in his eyes. You place a hand on his shoulder and put him under no pressure to carry on. The constant bickering between Boindil and Bavrigor distracts you. Goimgar hears the clanking of armor first. Something's coming! Before you know it, the orcs are charging towards you over a hillside. Yeah! Please wait a moment! And what huh? now? Yeah. Killed! Mm. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, oh, of course! Yes? Yeah! Uh huh? Oh, oh, no, no, no. Yeah! He hardly put up a fight! Huh? What is it? Huh? huh? Yeah! What is it? Huh? Don't take it personally. Yes! What is it? What's up? And oh, oh, wow. bad luck for you! I didn't hit you very hard! As yes, good as yes. done! On my way! On my way! As good as done! On my way! As good as done! Yes, yes. done. Yes? Yeah! And what now? And again! What is it? Yes? What is it? Kill with yourself! Ha ha! On my way! Of course! 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 As good as done! Of course! I want to know you Yes, yes! Oh, he didn't hit you very hard! Oh, my God! Take me here! Take me here! I've been too much! He hardly put up a fight! Huh? 
Yeah! Good job. Die forever! Huh? Yes. Yeah! Another one bites the yes. dust! Oh, oh, go. Who's next? Oh, On my way! Yes! For you! Huh? Yeah! Huh? What is it? What's up? He hardly put up a power! Another one I? bites the dust! Of oh, course! Refreshing. Hey, here comes some more. Three, four, five, five or six. Five or six? Oh, phew. He means five or six hundred. Goimgar turns white as a sheet. That's too many. To the city. Come on. You flee towards Mifidania, with Goimgar out ahead. The orcs at his back seem to have mobilized unimagined powers in him, and he reaches the gate first, hammering manically against it. He says something and scurries through a small gateway that has been opened to him. Moments later, you also reach the gate. Get in, quickly! You push your way through the gate as the first orc arrows slam into the wood next to you. The other dwarf said we should bolt the gate behind him, but we could use all the help we can get when the orcs come. That treacherous sissy! Where is he? Boendal and I will look for him. Boindiel and Bavragor, help the city guards in any way you can. You were certain the two of them wouldn't be much help in the search for Goingar. Weyun is well known for its love of the written word. Some of the scripts on offer are known to you from Lot Yonan's library. I am glad that the children of Vrakus are here. <laughs> what can I do for you, sir? The man tries to give off an air of normality, but he occasionally glances nervously over to the city wall. This is the biggest human city I've ever seen. After Parista. You haven't chosen a very good time to take a look at Mifidania, sir. And I don't just mean because of the orcs outside our gates. The winter is only just now retreating into the mountains. In a couple of weeks, it will be spring. 
and the city will burst into bloom. The man glances at the city wall once again. At least, I hope it will. Have you heard any news from other lands? Nodon is rampaging through the land with his orcs and the Alpha. The Magi are all dead, and no one has heard any more of the host that moved against Porista. These are dark times, but I think it's important that we don't despair. We must trust in the gods. We have to. You would have liked to have told the trader that, as well as trusting in the gods, he should also wish you and your companions luck. But that would have just led to more questions. Farewell, and good luck. In the past, travelling showmen regularly put up tents like this in front of Lot Yonan's vaults to draw a little money from the pockets of the servants and the famuli, with plays, vocal performances and all kinds of fun. The fabulous Rodario. Cometh, dear spectators, cometh and see! Let the Theatre Curiosum, with its star actor, the fabulous Rodario, the mysterious Nomora, and the genius Magister Technicus, Fergas, carry you off to another world! Now see and hear, dear spectators, the truth about Nudin the Knowledge Lusty who disposed of the other Magi in a most horrifying way and plunged Girdlegard into disaster. <laughs> Girdlegard, it will be mine. Lot Young? <laughs> When you murdered Frala and the others. <laughs> to your horror, you realize that you can no longer talk. You feel a lump in your throat and your eyes begin to burn as images of the vaults and Syntharas appear in front of you. I see that my first strike really hit you, Groundling. Oh, how they screamed. If only you had been there to help them. What do you want with my rucksack? If you're looking for provisions, you could have just asked me nicely. I'm not interested in what's in the rucksack. I only know that the Lord of the Perished Land wants it. So he will have it. Your master doesn't tell you much by the sounds of it. Either he doesn't trust you, or he's in the habit of not talking about his business with servants. You feel the blade cutting into your skin, and you take it as a sign of a small victory. This way! What, what was that, an elf? If we're quick, we'll get that long ear yet! Alarm! Alarm! The orcs are attacking! Come, we must defend the walls! Yes? Let's go! Oh, For you! Fire, Fire you you. forever! <laughs> yes! Oh, what bad luck for you! <laughs> Fire, Fire, Fire you you. forever! Huh? Come oh, on, boy! File through! Oh, go! Who's <laughs> Yes. luck for you. Another one He hardly put up a fight. forever. What is it? Huh? And again. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. A lot of for you. Take a hammer. A lot of luck for you. Take you. Understood. Enough for you. Don't take it as well as that. And again. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, oh, bad luck for you. Oh, yeah, well, uh, and say goodbye forever. Kill. And again. Very good. We're able to stop them. Sintorx. You wish it weren't so. But it is clear to you now that the city can no longer be saved. To the side gate. It's our only chance. Yes? End it! Understood. Fabracus! End it! Huh? He hardly put up a fight! <laughs> a bit and too what good. now? Was I? Kill him! I'm with you! Yes! yes. Alright! What is it? Of course! How are you doing? What's up? Mm. Huh? Yeah. Who's next? Huh? Huh? Come here, you! Huzzah! And what now? On my way! Come here, you! Huh? He hardly put up a fight! What is it? Prepare ah! yourself! What is it? As good as you! Ow! Yes! Hey! As good as you! It's locked. We have to open it somehow. Perhaps we can be of service, gentlemen. Step aside. Are you thieves? Certainly not. We are artists. People with extraordinary talents. So, friends, as you clearly mean to leave Mifadania too, would you have anything against us joining you? The fabulous Rodario. Oh, an admirer of my skills? Who would have thought it? I am indeed the one and only fabulous Rodario. This worthy gentleman here is Fergas, the best Magister Technicus since human thought. And last but not least, the enchanting Namora, whose beauty makes the mayor's roses wither in envy. Uh, perhaps we should discuss the rest when we are out of this mess. We have a long and dangerous journey ahead of us. I don't think you really want to join us. An epic and dangerous journey? That sounds like an adventure. And anyway, I have already seen that you know how to handle those weapons of yours. In these dangerous times, a big travel group offers the best protection, don't you think? I don't know. I... The orcs are still surging through the gate and over the wall. You decide that this isn't the right time for discussions. All right, then. Let's go. Let's get out of here. We'll be safe with the Firstlings. The Firstlings? The splendor of their halls is said to be unrivaled. And I have heard they have fascinating contraptions, Fergas, that are almost reminiscent of magic. It's open. Let's go.
In the evening after your escape from Iphidania, you recover from your exertions around a campfire. Goimgar withdraws to a solitary corner. Bavrigor devotes himself to his alcohol, and the twins get their smelly dwarf cheese out. Nemora and Fergus exchange hugs and kisses on the other side of the fire, while Rodario sits next to you. Ah, a journey with real dwarves to the stronghold of the firstlings. I'm sure I can write that into my new piece. I must congratulate you on your skills. Find it hard to believe that it's not achieved by magic. Aha, thank you, but I assure you it has nothing to do with magic. Just alchemy and accomplished acting. We leave the sorcery to the Magi. Don't mention them. There's no love lost to Andakai and her walking iron tower. You've met Andokai the Tempestuous? That is unbelievable! How was she? She ran away to the Outer Lands. A damn disgrace! Adakai had her reasons to leave us. She had already fought against Nodon and was unsuccessful. Furthermore, we wouldn't be here without her, and she told us about Keenfire. Andokai, the bringer of hope. I like that. I'll have to use that in my new piece. True to his words, Rodario takes out his notebook and writes something down. Do you know anything about the Firstlings? If I recall the map correctly, we need to cross the first large mountains in the Red Range and then pass through Snowdale to East Ironhald Stronghold. No one has seen the Firstlings for hundreds of cycles, but there are many stories about them. Their craftsmanship is much vaunted, and there used to be trade via a narrow path that led into the mountains. But I don't think there is a man living now who has ever walked that road. We're far enough away from Mephidania. Perhaps we should part ways tomorrow morning. Rodario jumps up and begins to gesticulate ostentatiously. I think you have underestimated us. Let me introduce myself and my colleagues once more. I am the fabulous... We don't have time to look after a pack of jesters. Rodario seems offended for a moment, but then he grins, turns away from the group, and raises his right arm. A jet of flame shoots out of his sleeve. The dwarves are startled and amazed by the brief spectacle. <laughs> and what do you say now, critical Mr. Dwarf? <laughs> You're a magus. I don't particularly like them either. At the Curiosum, magic is my area of responsibility. There is a tube under his arm with a flint and a bag full of lycopedia seeds. When he firmly presses the bag, the flint sprays sparks and the seeds shoot out. And there you have it. Magic fire. B -b -b Masterly work, Fergus! The Magister Technicus shows his appreciation with a nod of his head. If they all have tricks like this up their sleeves, oh, they might not be such a burden after all, Tungnil. How are you doing for provisions? We don't have enough. We are happy to share what we have. It isn't very much, though. We had to leave most of it behind. Food is sure to be a problem on our journey. Winter's only just beginning to leave, Wayan, and people will be keeping a tight grip on the stocks they do have because of the orc attacks. We have to be frugal and organize as much food as we can. It wouldn't be much of a heroic story if we starved on the way to the Firstlings. Our mission is to forge the legendary axe Keenfire and destroy the traitor Nodon. If you wish to accompany us through hunger, coldness and danger, then do so. It's your decision. How could we not partake in such a story? Just think, what a wonderful play we could make of it! If we survive. I was hoping to only resurface once we reach the Red Range. Instead, we have a long journey and a dangerous climb ahead of us. Hmm, there may be another way apart from the old trading route. A few years ago, an old man from the north told me of a place called Wackenstein. Apparently, there is an old path there, older than the dwarven tunnels themselves. 
Legends and stories. There's too much uncertainty. Let's just see what the next few days bring. You reach a large camp with dozens of humans, countless campfires, and several wagons in and around the camp. You notice traders and guardsmen with Mifadania's coat of arms, but also others that you don't know. You decide to take a look around the camp. All in all, the refugees are in bad shape, and you can't even see the slightest glimmer of hope in most of their eyes. Ha! I know you, dwarf. You were in Mifadania. Ran off with your friends when things got tricky, eh? You're not such great orc killers, or you wouldn't have left Mifadania to its fate. We are dwarves, not gods. We did our best. No one could have saved Mifadania. The fatigue that had disappeared from the man's face for a moment returns. I hated that city with its wretched stench of fish. It's just so many dead. We're headed to the old dwarf stronghold on the Red Range. Do you know the way? You're going to travel through Snowdale so soon after winter. <laughs> Good luck. And what are you hoping to find? There aren't any dwarves left in the mountains, I'm telling you. We'll see. What about the old trading route? The trader shrugs his shoulders. Head west. There is only one road that leads into the mountains. If you've got a death wish, then you're heading the right way. I can see some guardsmen from Mifidania here too. How did you escape? The authorities ordered the guards to protect the city to the very last man, while they, the High Society, made off unnoticed. When the guards and the townspeople saw them go, they dropped their weapons and ran. The quickest made it. Just a few dozen. A few dozen. How many people could you have saved if you'd stayed? On the other hand, how many will die if you don't stop nod on? You're heading south. I wish you luck. You don't think these people have much of a chance of survival, and a last look at the trader's face reveals that he doesn't either. You spend the night protected from the wind in a ruin, and are sitting around a campfire as the topic of your new companion's performance on the stage comes up. Sleight of hand, speed, alchemy and makeup can have an incredible effect. Namora transformed herself into an alf using the latter. I also noticed your weapons, Namora. I have never seen such swords before. Their names are Crescent and Sunbeam. I designed them myself. It took a long time until I found a smith who was able to make them. She looks like a pointy ear, too. Nature hasn't been kind to her. For this absent-minded remark, Boindil receives evil looks from Nomura and grins from the men. Perhaps I really am an elf and will bring you a nightmare in your sleep tonight. Don't be surprised if you wake up screaming. For a moment, it seems as though she has merged with the darkness, but when you blink... Everything is back to normal. By the gods! Isn't she magnificent in her role? There is no denying what Rodario says. You are walking past an inconspicuous copse as Namora suddenly stops on the spot. Wait! We are not alone. Someone is watching us. A, a trap? Die, scum! What are you doing? Why are you attacking us? We're dwarves too. We're on the same side. I see honest dwarves here, but they are accompanied by scum. I will free you of it. Oh, really? And what are you going to do on your own against eight? You. Come here. What? Ha <laughs> ha! Brother! What? What are you doing? Boindil, Boindil, what's wrong? Come to your senses! It's no use. They belong to me. Now die, scum.
Yes. Hmm? Hmm? Enemies, they're all here. Uh huh? What? Yeah. 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 Your comrade is in danger. I'm on it. Yes, yes. Come on, yes. 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 I didn't hit you very hard. I'm not quick. Like yes. Yes. <sighs> yes. Yes, yes. So I'll be ready again soon. Well, I'm on it. I'm not that quick. Huh? Right? Yeah. Yes, yes. So, uh -huh. I'm on my way. Oh. All right then. Fine. End it. Yes, yes. Soon. I'm not that I'm on my way. way. Yeah. What? Yes. What is it? I'm on it. it. Yes, yes. Soon. Come on, right then. Just a minute. Yes. Yeah. Huh? I'm on it. Hmm. What is it? I'm on my way. I need some assistance! No sooner does the unknown dwarf fall unconscious to the floor than her control over your comrades disappears. You fetter and gag her until you know more about her sinister powers. That was, uh, <clears throat> I hope I didn't hurt you, Scholar. It was as if in a dream, but at the same time, it wasn't. I heard her voice in my head, and although I knew better, I only saw orcs attacking me. You were the enemy. Boindil goes over to the shackled dwarf and kicks her gently with his boot. This is never a child of the smith, even if she looks like one. Those gifts. By Vrakas, there is something evil at work. You kneel in front of the dwarf and press your axe against her throat. My name is Tungdil. If I remove your gag, will you answer some questions? The captive nods, and you pull the gag out of her mouth. Geralda is my name. It would seem I underestimated you. Your powers? I've never heard of anything like it. Neither have I. I haven't had them for long. When I try to remember, all I see is black mist and... I taste iron and mud, and there's an Alf who... Oh. <sighs> Did the Alpha give you these powers? When I try to remember, it hurts. Like needles sticking into my head. I am Gerelda Bloodstone. I am... I was... Oh. <laughs> you said something about scum when you attacked us. Has Namora done anything to harm you? Not her. But her kind. Alpha. She is a human. She only acts at being an elf in theatre. In the theatre? For the first time, Geralda looks at Namora without a hateful expression. She... she must die. Where have you come from and what brings you to Wayan? I was on my way to the Free Folk. They are said to live in the middle of Girdelgard without kingdoms or their laws. The Free Folk? You mean dwarves? Yes. Dwarves who have left their kingdoms, voluntarily or otherwise. Not everyone has a place in their kingdom. You instinctively think of your own plight. You are not a secondling, and won't be welcome among the fourthlings since you placed obstacles in their king's path. Don't believe this nonsense, scholar. 
The free folk are just a fairy tale that people tell themselves when they don't want to stick to the traditions. Just look what good it's done Geralda. Geralda prepares to reply, but then she holds back. Enough talk! She is dangerous, probably crazy. She attacked us, we should put an end to her. It's what you call amnesia, memory loss, a tool often used in stage productions. We don't know what happened to her, and maybe she doesn't either. We can't just kill her. She's too dangerous just to let go, so well, we'll take her with us. Remove the fetters. You nip any objection in the bud and turn to Geralda. Listen, I don't know what has happened to you, but we are dwarves and we shouldn't fight against one another. We could do with your help. The female dwarf seems just as surprised by your decision as your companions. I... thank you. I would be happy to accompany you. I am Gerelda Bloodstone, of the Fourth Link Kingdom. I'm sorry that I attacked you. It was a misunderstanding. You realise that your decision doesn't please everyone. Boindil and Namora seem particularly upset, but they hold back and you continue on your way, a slightly gloomy mood hanging over the group. When you enter the pretty little village with its richly ornate houses and its temple to Palandiel at its centre, you can see an angry mob some distance away. The villagers are hassling a young woman, insulting her and pushing her to the ground. You push your way through the crowd of people and stand in the way of the villagers. What's going on here? A man dressed in richly decorated vestments looks you up and down. Pelendil will be with you, dwarf. It is none of your business, but this woman here is a thief. She and her henchmen have emptied the monastery's granary and were willing to abandon us to our fate. That's a lie. We asked for help and these people turned us away. I came back to ask again. What evidence do you have against this woman? We found the granary broken into. Almost a third of our grain and a significant amount of supplies have gone. And all this just one day after she and her people were snooping around here. That isn't proof. It could simply be coincidence. Anyway, why would a thief come back to the scene of a crime? The priest eyes you in silence, while some of the villagers make it clear that dwarves should keep their noses out of their business. Tell us what happened. The villagers grumble, but the priest gives the woman a chance to defend herself. My name is Tavia. I was forced to flee Tabayin with my family when the parish land began to spread. My husband, he... <sighs> We had to leave him behind. The horror in the woman's eyes gives you a good idea as to what became of her husband. No one accepted us in the north. There are too many refugees and everyone is scared. Queen Wei has offered land in Wei and to anyone who will work hard for it. But what should we grow if no one will sell us grain? We offered a fair price, but Father Mallon... She darts a scathing gaze at the priest. He wanted double the amount. The priest glances briefly at the angry villagers. Then he replies in a firm voice. It was a hard winter, and with the increasing frequency of orc attacks, we must think of ourselves first and foremost. Even we cannot help everyone. The bystanders mutter in agreement. Let the woman go. The priest looks at you in astonishment. He is not used to being given orders. But before he can reply, you step towards him and beckon him down to you.
Do you see that dwarf with the two axes? He doesn't like it when a mob wants to lynch someone that may be innocent. You should bear that in mind when you answer. The priest gives Boyndeel a worried glance. Beads of sweat are forming on his brow. But a priest of Palandiel isn't so easily intimidated. You there, lock the woman up in the guardhouse. And you, Mr. Dwarf, should leave our village. Good day. The woman is taken into a squat building made of rough blocks of stone. The crowd slowly disbands. You enter the village's large storehouse. The ground floor of the two-story building is full of turnips, with large barrels and clay pots on the floor and on high shelves. Several villagers are carrying out stock-taking. They're being supervised by a weedy man who observes them with a grim expression and writes things on a wax tablet every now and then. There are sacks piled up on top of one another on the first floor. They are most likely filled with different kinds of grain and, judging by the omnipresent white dust, flour. You walk towards the only area in the storeroom where you can see the floorboards. You hesitate as your boots slip on the floor, as if you're walking on mud. Tungdil. The Magister Technicus carefully observes the roof beams above the empty corner. He grabs at a beam and crumbles something between his fingers. You can't make out what it is, so you copy him and feel damp, rotten wood. It's very easy to pull away small pieces. What are you doing here? The man with the wax tablet is standing on the stairs. He sounds half angry, half shocked. No one is allowed in here. Who are you? And what are you doing here if no one is allowed to be here? I'm allowed to be here. It's my job. I'm the steward of the temple. Morris is my name. The rain has gotten here. The roof and the floor are damp. Those savages! It wasn't enough that they steal from us. They had to damage the roof, too. That was probably where they got in. The wood didn't start to rot yesterday, good man. The steward's face turns bright red. And you are the experts on such things, are you? Assuming the roof here has been leaky for a long time, what would have happened to the grain in the sacks directly underneath? Wouldn't it have turned rotten? The man wets his lips. His gaze darts around the room. The roof was fine. I'll have it repaired. And now, get out of here! The steward angrily blocks off all further attempts at talking to him, and even when you threaten him with Father Malin, it doesn't have the desired effect. The father trusts in him, he says, and he's always been a devout follower. The heavy door of the storehouse closes behind you, and you hear a bolt sliding into place from the inside. You enter the guardhouse, and before the guards know, Boindil and Boendal have caught them up in a friendly conversation. Shielded from the view of the guards, you exchange a few words with the suspect without being disturbed. Where have you taken the grain and supplies? I don't know anything about grain or supplies. Apart from the fact that we could do with both, I'm telling you, I am innocent! We won't let anyone do anything to you, but if we are going to help you, you will have to tell us the truth. The woman looks you in the face, then her head sinks, and when she looks back up, she has tears in her eyes. Please, I just want to go back to my family. I don't know what happened. <clears throat> Tongue deal. You feel sympathy towards the woman. You raise your hand to silence Rodario and nod to the woman to continue talking. We asked for grain and were full of hope when we saw the well-filled granary. But we hadn't reckoned on the malice of the people here. A slow, ironic clap sounds from behind you. Confused, you turn around to face Rodario. Bravo, my dear, with tears and everything. Tough luck that a master of the art of acting is present. None of what she said corresponds with the truth, Tungdil. She is lying and trying to deceive us. Not completely talentless, for an amateur. You expect the woman to deny everything, but when she overcomes her amazement, 
she spits in the actor's face. <laughs> and what if I am? I would do it all again. The people here have more than they need and my people are starving. Is that fair? Why did you come back here after stealing the grain and supplies? We didn't steal them. We paid for them. A reasonable price, just not to Father Malin. You had help? He promised us three dozen sacks of grain. When we opened the sacks in our hideout, we realised that most of the grain was rotten. He thought he'd get away with it. The woman looks around wearily. And by the looks of things, he has. Spit it out. Where are the spoils and your people? I'd rather die than tell you that. The woman looks at you determinedly, and neither of you blink. Morris the steward offered you the grain, didn't he? What does that matter? I've no proof it was him. And even if I did, if I admit that we have the stuff, I'll be hanging from a tree by this evening and my children will starve. I beg you, let me go. We bought the grain and the supplies. Perhaps, perhaps he wasn't allowed to sell it to us. But we paid. And with a little seed we can sow, at least some of us have a chance of surviving the year. I don't want you to be hanged just because you tried to support your family. Go. You open the door. The guards jump up, take up their swords and let their hands sink down again when they feel the axes of the dwarves against their throats. The woman lays a hand on your shoulder for a moment as a sign of gratitude before she runs from the guardhouse. I hope you know what you're doing, scholar. Rodario's furrowed brow does not give you the feeling you've made an undisputed decision. Namora, find out where she's heading, and then rejoin us. Fergus wants to raise an objection, but before he can think of the right words, Namora has kissed him on the mouth and has disappeared round the next corner. You leave the guardhouse and explain your plan to Father Malin. You expect him to object, but he seems to be satisfied. You assume he'll make you responsible for everything if something goes wrong, and will claim a peace for himself if you are successful. Like every night in the wilderness, you set up camp and assign the watch. Bavrigor takes first watch this evening, while the rest of you sit by a small fire, toasting some bread. You are not particularly surprised that neither Bavrigor nor any of the others notice the guest who suddenly appears out of the darkness next to you. Namora! Fergus jumps up, and moments later has embraced her tightly. Were you able to find out anything? She didn't detect me and led me straight to the hideout. I can show you. It's a cave some miles off from the path. Almost four dozen people, men, women and children. You nod. You have tracked down Tavia's hideout. The group isn't overly friendly towards Geralda, and this evening she's sitting once again apart from the others. You ask yourself what you can do to break the ice, when you see that she has a file in her hand. The file is wrapped around with silver wire and has a snap lock. The liquid in it is black. Geralda opens the lid and takes a big swig. As she puts down the bottle, a smile flits across her face, followed by a short expression of deep satisfaction. It is the first time that you have seen a positive emotion on the face of the sombre dwarf. Is that medicine? No, it's... <sighs> I don't know either. If I don't drink it, I have a longing for it. It gets stronger and stronger until it... until I can't stand it anymore. When I drink it, the longing disappears and I feel rested and strong. And when the file's empty? I don't know. I don't know where I got the drink from let alone what it is. But if I don't drink it, oh, Rackers, give me strength. I think I would go crazy or die. Geralda plays with the file, lost in her thoughts, 
as if she were trying to remember where she saw it for the first time. You discover some ancient ruins and an orc camp in a gorge. A small group of Bognolim is moving between tents, piles of rubbish and cages. In one of the cages, you think you can make out some movement. They're coming out the holes. You there! My bag! Over there! Quick! You'll have to smoke them out! Yes? Grenades! Throw them into the holes! That ought to stop the little beasts! I'm oh, alright then! Get Get away. Away. Why not? I'm oh. alright then! Huh? I'm Enter there. yourself! I'm alright then! Not? Get I'm away! I'm alright! Right. Why not? Yes? I'm alright! Right. Right. My hammer! I'm all right then! I'm all right. Right. Why not? Good night! I'm all right, right then! I'm, I'm on it! My I'm hammer! Away. I'm all right! I'm all right then! Oh, hey, Rackers! Right. Long Good night! Right. And again! I'm all right then! Good night! Why, Why not? I'm all right then! Why not? Oh. Yeah! Yeah! I'm a wild creature. Get Why, not? Why not? I can't do that yet. Please wait a moment. I'm on my way. way. Get All right then. And again. Ah, I, I can't do that yet. You, was I? Please wait a moment. I can't do that yet. I'm on my way. Why not? Yeah? How many is that now? Shh. Looking for enemies? They're all here! Let me get. Sweetheart! Or anyone who I could do with <laughs> some help! Too much fun, was I? Don't take it personally! Welcome to the future! <laughs> A bit too much fun, was I? <laughs> Disgusting! Kill. How many is that now? Personally. What? And again. I can't do that yet. Good night. Vile creature. Oh, well, yeah? Why not? Well, well, swift and quiet. Killed, huh? They're hitting me pretty hard! Vile creature. Killed. On my way. Vile creature! I can't do that yet! Attack! Killed! At once! Favrakus! Vile creature! <laughs> Very impressive, I must say! Let me out, my friends. Oh, thank you. Have you seen Helga? Helga? Helga! 
What are you? Hello? I am Tungdil Goldhand. These are my companions Boindil, Boendal, Rodario, Fergus and Namora, Bavragor and Goimgar. Have you seen Elga? No, we haven't. If you don't mind me asking, what is your name? Call me Ensign and drop the pleasantries. If I may, who is this Helga? Helga? Where? Um, I don't know. I just wanted to know. Helga is my wife. Didn't, didn't I mention that? We came here together, but then the orcs came and she was gone. Do you think she might have gone home? Helga! You have a dark notion of what might have happened to Helga, but as you have no proof, you'd rather say nothing. If, if, if you see her, you let me know, right? What brings you to these parts, Henson? It's not exactly the nicest of places. Aren't you here for the festival? The unbelievable Wackenstein Festival? My wife and I desperately wanted to see it for ourselves. The blind guardian, the statue over there, is the key. He calls people from far and wide to the festival. I finally found some information in the archives of Verunciensis as to how the guardian is activated. Do you know anything about a secret passage through the mountains? Secret passage? Er, uh, no. Can't say I do. But they say that when the blind guardian awakens, then people will come to the festival from all corners of the world. Maybe they'll come from the mountains too. I wanted to thank you. Your grenades really helped us. Grenades? Oh, yeah, no problem. I used them to break up boulders, but I ended up attracting these pests. Who was to know there are bognolim around here? And as if that weren't bad enough, along came the orcs and took me ox school. Class! And Helga, where is Helga? So what have you found out about the festival, Henson? You, you see that statue? That's the blind guardian. You, you could call him the, uh, the patron saint of Wackenstein. They say that when the festival begins, then the revellers heed his call from all corners of the earth. According to my research, we need three things to start the festival. A burning ox skull, the fire eater bell and vervain. I actually had it all, but, uh, well, yeah, then the orcs came. Where will we find the Fire Eater Bell, and what kind of a name is that anyway? Verinciensis. I'll track you down to a collector who lives outside the city in an estate on the south wall. According to the legend, the bell was mounted in a black tower. The tower caught fire. The bell fell down and smothered the source of the fire. Now, I'm sure you can work out the rest. The ringing of the bell opens the way for the blazing fire in our souls. At least that's what, what is written. Verunciensis. So what are we waiting for? We'll visit the collector and... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be best if he went without me. I have some things to prepare here. Vervain, doesn't that grow in Ergon? It's a hell of a long way from here. Ha! <laughs> Don't worry, I have a bag, um, where, uh, just a minute, I, um, it's gone. You lost it? Well, lost, I mean, you know, briefly mislaid, perhaps. It must be here somewhere. It should be easy to find an ox's skull. All we have to do is find a butcher. Oh, it can't just be any old ox skull. It needs special decorations and engravings. Took me weeks to prepare that skull. Then the orcs came and took it. Must have thought it had some value. So, we've got to hunt down an army of orcs. Boindil will like that. What do we do with the skull when we've got it? Oh, well, that's simple. The ox skull must be set on fire. You're not sure what kind of celebration needs a burning ox skull, but the mission doesn't sound too difficult. 
To begin the festival, we need the ox skull, the fire eater bell, and the vervain, right? Exactly. Then we need to set the skull on fire, ring the bell, and burn the herbs. And then it happens. You're quite sure you're wasting your time. A huge festival in the middle of nowhere. But you pin your hopes on there being a spark of truth in every story, and that somehow a path will open up through the mountains when you carry out the old ritual. See you later, Henson. Let me know if you say Elga. If I've understood correctly, the ox skull is to be burned on this stack of wood. Henson said the herbs should be burned in a bowl. This must be the bowl he meant. Now we just need the herbs. A bracket on which you could hang something. Must be for the bell that Henson mentioned. Ah, that must be Henson's bag of herbs. Something's not quite right. As on the previous evening, Bavrigor sits apart from the others. But tonight, he waves you over. Smeralda, my sister. You want to know what happened, right? You nod and sit down. She followed Boindle into battle. We tried to talk her out of it, but she was as unyielding as a mountain. Then came the day when the High Pass was attacked. Bavrigor drinks from his liquor. He killed her. Blinded by the frenzy of battle, he thought she was one of the enemy. We can never forgive him. He killed my sister. Could you? You inevitably remember the loss of Lot Yonan, Frala, and her children. You remain sitting in silence, each of you deep in thought. Boendal approaches, having either heard you or guessing what you were talking about. His fierce life forge is a curse. He thought the orcs had robbed him of his love, and the ire came over him. Sometimes he calls her name in his dreams. Oh, he'd never admit it. But he suffers just like Bavragor. He too loved her. The stonemason doesn't react, so you and Boendal go back to the others by the fire. From far off you can already see the orc camp, blocking the pass to the firstlings. You move away from the path and observe the camp from a nearby cliff. You see strong fortifications and hundreds of orcs. Finally! Now that's what I call a challenge! Let's go! Frontal attacks may have worked in the past, but this here is more like capturing a stronghold. It requires a large military force or a good strategy. Both would be best. We should search for another way. I could go and take a look, and perhaps improve our chances for an attack. You remember how the actor had transformed himself into Lot Yonin and Nudin in Mephidania? You certainly wouldn't bet against him being able to walk through the orc camp unnoticed. I'll come with you. If I stay in the shadows, they won't see me. The actor nods gratefully. I'll come too. I also know how to keep myself hidden. Namora wants to object, but you are quicker. Thank you, Geralda. Two more eyes and ears would be helpful on such a mission. Listen, try to sabotage their defences, and if you can safely take out a couple of guards, then do it. But don't take any big risks. Come back here if things get too hairy. 
Nemora and Rodario rejoin you without any particular urgency. The infiltration was a complete success. No one detected the two of them. The guards are much more alert now since the infiltration of the Orc camp. You have delivered a serious blow to your enemy, and an attack should now be significantly easier. You enter the Orc camp with your companions. You have a long way ahead of you. A two-story tavern sits on the corner of a crossroads. The snow around the building has been cleared away, and a warm light is coming from inside. The sign above the door reads, Minstrel Castle. Minstrel Castle? That sounds promising. Finally! Time for ale! My throat is completely parched! As much as I hate agreeing with you, I too can hardly wait. You enter the tavern with Bavrigor and Boindil in front. On first impression, the interior is as inconspicuous as the outside. But when you take a closer look, you spot a couple of paintings of minstrels in front of a castle, a small stage that, judging by the dust, is only very rarely used, and a lute hanging on the wall behind the bar. There are not very many guests on the ground floor, perhaps a dozen, and most of them belong to a group of mercenaries who have retreated into the far corner. You sit at a table, and after a while you are brought the ale that Boindil has ordered. You go to the bar where the landlady is working and sit on a stool. The landlady, a stout, middle-aged woman with long hair tied in a ponytail, looks up briefly but says nothing. Say, why is the tavern called Minstrel Castle? It doesn't look much like a castle. Oh, you don't know the legend, dwarf. <laughs> One of the guests next to you at the bar takes up your question. There was a castle here once. No one knows its name anymore. So everyone just calls it Minstrel Castle. Once upon a time a king lived in that castle. He had many subjects and an enchanting queen. But one day a young minstrel came along and sang of wonderful far-off lands, and the subjects began to complain about their own lives. So the king sent for the singer to hear for himself. He came and sang a wonderful love song, and the king began to be scared. He thought that the minstrel wanted to steal away his queen. Without flinching, he drew his sword and struck the boy down. His father heard of this. He was himself a singer. And so he went to the king and played a terrible song. A curse. The king was to vanish in silence, and no one was to remember his name. And that's what happened. No one remembers the name of the king or his castle. Make of it what you will. The story's certainly well known enough in the area to give our in its name. You nod at the landlady as you slip off the bar stool, and she nods back. Bavrigor and Boindil, who are absorbed in a drinking competition, have to be practically dragged out of the tavern. But in the end, you are able to continue your journey. You arrive at an empty jetty on Lake Anteria. You can see several fishing boats on the lake, and there's a small village on the other shore. Ah, Polebrook, what an idyllic little place. And then there's the miller's daughter. <laughs> hey there, would you be able to ferry us over to the other side? At first you think the fisherman hasn't heard you, but then he turns around and heads towards the shore. When the boat has almost reached you, the fisherman calls back. Dwarves, are you lost? Oh well, whatever. I am Samuel. If you wish to cross, it'll cost you. Food for ten days or twenty gold, whichever you prefer. You give Samuel the gold, and after a long discussion with the dwarves in the group, you follow him onto the boat. The dwarves literally leap out of the boat as soon as you reach dry land. We could have died! I hope it was worthwhile, scholar!
You can make out a cave in the bank of a dried-out riverbed, with several small fires burning in it. You don't see any guards, so you approach carefully. Men and women jump as they notice you. There is terror written in their emaciated faces. When a little girl screams and runs away from you, the whole camp is alerted, and a group of men and women step out of the cave. Is that them? Your benefactors? Tavia, who came out of the cave next to the man, nods. You've led them straight here. Who are you? The man resembles Tavia. His face too tells of a struggle between defiant determination and fatigue and resignation. I am Gerald, Tavia's brother. I led these people here from Tabayin. You look around you. You guess there are about ten families, less than fifty people. Half of them are children and youths. Tabayin is a fertile country in the north, but much more importantly these days, it borders the Perish land to the east. How are things in Tabayin? Gerald's expression changes. It's as if he's looking through you. The Perish land is raging. It poisons the spirit, and those who become possessed by it just. Gerald looks at his hands, which he involuntarily forms into claws. They no longer recognize you, brothers, mothers, children. My brother-in-law. I had to. With visible effort, he wrenches himself free of his terrible memories. We can only hope that the Magi manage to build a new barrier soon. You cannot bring yourself to quash the last hope he has. Your sister couldn't have known that she was being followed. Namora has quite a talent for not being seen. She shouldn't even have gone to Seton in the first place. I knew that nothing good would come of it. Tavia went to Seton on her own initiative. Our gold was gone and our supplies were dwindling, despite being on half rations. I said we should just take what we need if no one is going to help us, but my sister wouldn't have anything to do with it. She took the wedding jewelry from our village, the most valuable thing we had with us, and sold it without my knowing. She then took this money and went to Seton with several men. I was completely beside myself when I heard about it, but then they came back with food and grain, and I thought they had really done it. He laughs cheerlessly and shakes his head. <laughs> For a few minutes, we thought we were saved. What's wrong with the grain from Seton? We thought we finally had a change of luck for the better. We were praying for a new start, but then we discovered that most of the grain was rotten and unusable. They'd been ripped off by the bloody steward. We all got together and discussed what was to be done. The majority was in favour of going to Seton and taking what was due at any price. The next morning, Tavia disappeared. It was clear to me that she had returned to Seton. We were going to give her a couple of days, and in the meantime, we prepared for our attack. We needed weapons, and we needed a plan. The supplies and the grain, where are they? Gerald glances at your companions. The grain is mainly useless. There's only four or five usable sacks. We shared out the supplies, and that'll keep us going for the next few weeks. If you return the grain, Father Malin may temper justice with mercy. Mercy? Gerald spits at the floor. <laughs> Let my people starve so that the people in Seton can live in affluence for another year. No, I won't let my family die. The grain and the supplies stay here. Gerald braces himself, placing his right hand on his axe. You're in greater need of the grain and the supplies than the people in Seton. Keep both. Gerald stares at you. Only after a few seconds does he finally close his mouth. I... Uh, uh, thank you very much, sir. When I saw you turn up here heavily armed, I thought the game was up. How could we ever justify letting people on the run die if we have enough to share ourselves? You see tired but happy faces all around you. The people breathe a collective sigh of relief. Oh, know this, 
Good dwarf, whenever you need help, we'll come, we'll stand by your side. We don't have much to offer you, but we can muster together a few strong arms for battle, and we have some outstanding archers. You nod, and are happy to have made some new friends. The size of the fields and the farmsteads grow as you get closer to Ferenciensis, the old border city in the north. The old city wall is much too small for the size of today's settlement. Everywhere little cottages, and even the odd magnificent estate, extend beyond the wall. The house that Henson was talking about must be somewhere on the south wall. We need the bell if we're going to open the path through the mountains. You follow the street to an estate on the south wall, which is surrounded by a fence. The paved path to the door is lined with hydrangea. You knock on the door gently, and after a while it is opened by a chubby man in expensive clothes. The man gives you a fleeting glance. We don't want to buy anything. He intends to close the door again without waiting for your answer. Wait! I've been told you have a rare bell, Fire Eater. The man pauses. Fire Eater? How? Before he can finish what he's saying, a red-haired woman pushes past him. She is also wearing expensive clothes and is heavily made up. After she gives him a stern look, the man disappears into the house. She scrutinizes you with greenish blue eyes. How do you know about that, shorty? A man called Henson. Henson? The vagabond that broke into our house? Now he's sending groundlings to assassinate us and steal our belongings. What did he tell you? That we have gold, jewels? Um, no. Henson is our adversary. We want to snatch the bell away from under his nose. The woman's eyes pierce through you. You manage with great effort to resist her gaze. Hmm. I'd like to get that ugly thing out of the house. All right, then. I'll sell you the bell for 500 gold pieces. 500 gold coins. All right, then. The woman takes the pouch of gold from you with a broad grin and disappears through the door, which slams shut with a loud bang. Uh, hello? Have you been duped? It dawns on you that you haven't yet seen the bell. The door opens again. The man of the house pushes out a wheelbarrow containing a large object inside a sack. May Fire Eater bring you great pleasure. The man dumps the bell on the floor with a muffled bong. He seems anything but happy that his wife has sold the bell. The all-too-familiar stench of tallow and grease reaches your nose. You know what this means. What's up? Huh? Huh? Oh, yeah. Little Peggies! <laughs> A bit too much for you, was I? Of course, course. he won't last long. Fire you! Bad luck for you! Who's next? Yes. Yes. Huh? On my way. 
vile creature. That's what I've done. And you got my forever. On my way, way to Ruckus. He was a right. As That's good as done. Who's next? And you got my forever. Oh, 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 You! I didn't hit you very hard! Wild creature! Be my pleasure! Oink, oink, little peggies! <laughs> and oh, what bad luck for you! For you. Pow! Yeah. Another one bites the dust! Oh, no way! Say Focus. goodbye forever! Yeah! Kill! Huh? And oh, yeah. what bad luck for you! Yes? And you yeah. are mine forever! Yeah! Ha -ha. yeah. I'm gonna get off! On my way! way. Uh huh? Yeah! Huh? I'm gonna get off! Who's next? I'm on my way! way. way. Vile creature! That's good on us! Say that die forever! He hardly put up a fight! Kill! Huh? Come yes, on way! What is it? Yes? Oh, 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 you. Bad luck for you. Who's next? Take a my forever. And what now? Ah! I didn't hit you so hard. What is it? I was going to hardly put up a fight. Oh, oh, my way. Way. That's That's good good Bad luck for you! Huh? Yeah! Yeah! Huh? I'm on my way! That's That's good good. And what now? Huh? Oh, oh, on my way! way. Vile creature! Come here, my you hammer! As good as you are! Vile creature! Kill him! Ah. Forever! Ah. Vile creature! On my way! Ha ha! As good as you are! Come here, my you. hammer! Huh? Yeah! Don't take it personal! While the others take care of their wounds, you find a brown, well-cared-for leather bag. You are certain the bag hadn't belonged to an orc, and inside, you actually find a decorated ox skull. This will please, Henson. With this, you are a step closer to a way through the mountains, or a huge disappointment. You enter Seaton and take a look round. Your path leads you once again to the Minstrel Castle Tavern. The warm, familial glimmer from inside is, as ever, inviting. You enter the tavern again 
You go to the... You nod at the landlady. Bavrigo... The old ruins of Wackenstein appear before you. All right. It's like a glove. Loud and powerful music follows the fog and the figures, crushing over your head in roaring waves. The force of the music clouds your senses, and it seems as if the statue of the blind guardian rises from his throne. You want to draw your companion's attention to it, but then you suddenly realize that you have a tankard of ale in your hand. You instinctively try it, and are happy to note that you haven't drunk such good ale since Ogre's death. The night becomes a colourful whirl of ale, music, dance and ecstasy. You can no longer remember why you are here or who you are celebrating with. For a few hours you forget what was and what is to come. You are completely in the here and now. You wake up the next morning. You are lying on your back and staring into a sky that is much too bright. You turn onto your side with difficulty and see your companions all around you, but no one else. The remains of a wild party. Campfires, tents, and ale tankards are still there, but the magic has gone. You stand up, muttering curses, and try to suppress the taste in your mouth and the pain in your head. To your great surprise, you see that the stony figure of the blind guardian has revealed a tunnel that leads into the rock of the mountain. If we go on now, we probably can't come back. The mechanism looks like it will close the pass behind us. We should be sure that we have done all we need to. While you rest under a ledge at noon, Rodario and Fergus decide to go ice fishing and the dwarves immediately pronounce their opposition. Ice and water are both treacherous. They entice you to them. Before you know it, you disappear into them forever. Like in a marriage, you mean? At first the woman entices you, but if you stay in her arms like a good boy, the good life is over all too quickly. The good life, in which you go behind the backs of other men, get beaten up and one day die painfully of a sexually transmitted disease. All slander, my dear. Rodario bares his teeth for a moment and then follows Fergus to the shore. He reminds me of a billy goat we used to have. Mounted everything that got in its way. One day he mounted a goat that was standing too close to a cliff. The two of them fell down the cliff in the best of spirits. <laughs> <laughs> Your path leads you over a snowy, hilly plain, and as you scale a particularly steep hill, you falter. A crevasse opens out in front of you. You look around, but there isn't any point nearby where you could cross over the gap.
you follow the course of the crevasse. After an hour, the end of the crevasse is still not in sight. However, you do find a cave that slopes down softly parallel to the crevasse. You are afraid that you might get lost in the ice cave and freeze to death in misery. But ultimately, your curiosity is rewarded. You find, after an hour's search, a winding passage that leads you to a large chamber. You walk ahead with your torch outstretched and see a shadow in the ice. You step backwards in shock as you realize that it's the body of a frozen human. Something glittering in the floor grabs Goimgar's attention. An ornamented gold shield. Part of it is frozen into the ice, but it should be easy to free. Pure gold! This thing must be worth quite a bit, though it would be completely useless in a fight. Wouldn't that be like tomb raiding? Your companion doesn't answer. It doesn't feel right. We'd best leave the shield with its owner. You take a short break and then look for a way back to the surface. You find it quickly and continue on your way without any further delay. You finally arrive at the entrance to a valley that curves its way towards Ironhald, the firstling stronghold. Uh, by Vrakus, we've done it! Get down! Up there! Run! I can't maintain the spell for long! Put him on Goimgar's shield! To the gate! Quick! As you approach the first gate, you see guards on the battlements. You call as you run. By Vrakus, we are dwarves of the kingdoms of the secondlings and the fourthlings. Open the gate! Their leader gives orders that you cannot hear, but moments later, the gate opens up for you. Report back! Man the walls and the defences! The guards follow the orders immediately. Who are you that lead the Alpha to our door? How dare you speak to us like that? Dwarf who seems to have no name! Boindil steps forward before you can stop him. I am Boindil Doubleblade, a child of the smith of Berowin folk. And that is my brother Boindal, who needs a healer immediately. The commander pulls down his scarf, and his face leaves you speechless. Only a dwarf could make such a fuss. Balander Steelfinger. I protect the main gate of the Firstlings, therefore it is my duty to regard all guests precisely before I invite them in. But... You were a woman! You have a keen eye, Boindil Doubleblade. The tender features and soft fluff leave no room for doubt. A female dwarf is the commander of the guard. She gives orders for the injured Boendal to be taken care of. Four dwarves pick him up on his shield, and Boindil follows them. Stay with your brother. I will bring the rest of you to Queen Zamtis, where you can explain what you're doing here. Come closer, and be welcome to the Kingdom of the Firstlings. I am Tungdil Goldhand of the Fourthling Kingdom. You introduce your companions one by one, not forgetting to mention the twins and the Mega too. You then explain the reason for your visit. You report on the advance of the Perish Land, 
the death of the Magi, and the dispute about the next High King. The dark brown eyes of the Queen fix on you for a moment before she speaks. What you report sounds very serious, Tungdo. You can be sure of the support of the Firstlings. How may we assist you? There is only one way to defeat Nodon. Keenfire. To forge it, we need the best smith your kingdom has to offer. Help us, and thus help your kingdom, my queen. The queen considers, then nods. So be it. Could there ever be a better time to revive the old commonality of the kingdoms? Balandis here is not only my best warrior, she is also my best smith. She will accompany you. Your eyes fall upon Balandis, and you notice the blood rushing to your cheeks. I will do my best. You can trust in my axe and my hammer. We must continue on our journey to the Fifthlings in the Grey Range. Then I will show you the entrance to the tunnels. You will be in the Perish Land within a few orbits. You know the tunnels, but still the Firstlings live in seclusion. Our isolation was self-imposed. My mother knew that the other kingdoms would not simply accept her as the Queen. She wanted to give them time to get used to it. Your Highness, in the name of the Council of the Kingdoms, I request that you send a delegation to the Blue Range to take part in the discussions. We all have a common enemy. There has never been any enmity between my kingdom and the others. It was more neglected friendship and habit that has made us strangers to one another. As soon as you set off for the Grey Range, we will head east to see our brothers and sisters again. I will have rooms prepared for you and your companions so that you can rest. It has been some time since we have had guests, but we still know what hospitality means. Come to me when you are ready to depart. Uh, hello. What is it, Tundo? What is it like living with the Firstlings? I haven't seen much yet, but many things seem to be different to life with the Secondlings in Ogre's death. I can't make any real comparisons either. I grew up here, and have never left our kingdom. I can hardly wait to see the halls of the Fifthlings. They were the best smiths before we took on the mantle. Don't expect too much. Their halls have been in the hands of the enemy for over a thousand cycles. I read that the Orcs avoid the stronghold, as if there were a curse on it. Even reading doesn't seem to be frowned upon among the Firstlings. You feel at home here. But that isn't only down to the books. It would seem that a lot of important positions are occupied by female dwarves in the Firstling Kingdom. Is it not common where you come from that men and women share the duties? Of course. Among the humans and the Secondlings, the women help out in the house so that the men have time for their duties. That's how it is written in the books, too. Here, posts are assigned according to the skills of the applicant, not gender. It's only natural that the most important posts are occupied by women. She winks at you and gives you a knowing glance, although the whole thing still befuddles you. See you later. Tungdil, I was wondering when you would pay me a visit. I thank you and Jeroen. You appeared at the right moment. May I, um, ask why? It was down to you. Your speech about the responsibility I owe to my realm. Lot Yonan was a good teacher. Her face darkens when she thinks of her old companion. There are a hundred reasons that Nodon deserves to die. That is why I went back to the Secondlings and took another look through the books. I discovered a passage that said Keenfire can only take its effect against evil when it is wielded by a foe of the Undergrounders. A foe of the Undergrounders? It's going to be difficult to persuade Nork to help us. I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but I think I might have an answer to the problem. The Alpha are also your foes, aren't they? What the...? Half-human, half-elf. 
My mother bequeathed me her gifts and her weapons. I got very little from my father, but his eyes are an advantage. And you're sure that only a foe of the Undergrounders can use Keenfire? Anyone can use it like a normal axe, but only a foe of the Undergrounders can command its magical powers. I don't know much about her, but a half-elf should pass as a foe of all dwarves. We should keep your parentage secret, especially from Geralda. I'm in no doubt that the Alpha did terrible things to her. And I'm not keen on letting her kill me. If what Nomura told me earlier is true, this Geralda could be just as great a danger as Nodon. She could take control of generals or kings, maybe even me. You are aware of the danger, but you don't have the energy to think about it right now. You push the problem aside. Then that's agreed. We will keep Nomura's secret to ourselves. All right then. You will wield Keenfire in the battle against Nodon. But we're going to have to make it first. You said it. The actress takes her leave with a little nod. How are things with Jerun? Could you help him? He's doing well. He should be back to full strength after some rest. You still don't know what kind of being is hidden under the armor. But the Mega's powers seem to have done a good job. The Firstlings have offered to improve his armor. And when one of the best smiths in Girdelgard offers something like that, you should definitely take them up on it. How was Synthras able to overcome your shield? Can Alphar use magic? No, certainly not. I don't know much about their people, but I think they have innate powers. Conjuring darkness, extinguishing fire, changing dreams. Little things that fill humans with fear and ensure the potency of terrifying legends about their people. Syntherast used a trick, not a spell. We killed two Alphar near Sovereignston. They had crystals on them which they had received from Nod On to protect them from the spells of the Magi. He must have used a stone like that. How are you and your powers? You look a little exhausted. I won't lie to you. It has already been too long since I was in a place where I can draw new strength. My power is trickling away like water from a leaky pipe. Is that perhaps a way to weaken Nod On? No, I wouldn't count on that. Even if we could keep him away from the magical realms, the being that lives within him has given him unknown powers. Take some rest, and I hope you'll still be here at dawn. The Mega gives you a reproachful look. Don't worry. We'll stand by you until this expedition has reached its destination. It feels good having the Mega and her companion at your side again. How is he? He's lost a hell of a lot of blood. The crazy glint in Boindil's eyes has given way to serious concern. Ha! I'm doing fine! You must rest, brother. Stay on your back so the wounds can heal. Fortunately, he hasn't lost his pig-headedness. As long as he has that, he'll come through. Boindil forces a grin, but you can imagine what he's really thinking and feeling. I thought Antikai was going to look after him. Didn't her magic help? We don't want her help. Magic is no use. And we certainly don't want anything to do with Samerson. You know there is no point arguing with the twins about magic. There is too much of a fine line between conviction and stubbornness. Boendal would rather die than be healed by the Mega. We'll have to go on without him. He won't manage more than a hundred paces without dropping down dead the state he's in. No! I'll manage, Scholar. Just give me two orbits, then I'll be fine. It's, it's just a scratch. Boendal tries to stand up, but he doesn't have the strength. You shake your head. Stay here and recover, Boendal. We'll meet you again in time for the big battle against Nodon. You have done your bit. But 
where one of us is, the other is two. It is the greatest deed that has ever been carried out by our people. Oh. It would seem you are right, Scholar. We'll be separated for the first time in our lives. I will miss you by my side in battle. The first hundred runts will be for you. You will have to protect him and the others on your own now, brother. Don't take on too much and rein in your frenzy. You must control your anger better than you usually do. Promise me. I promise. Tears run down the bearded cheeks of the two twins. They have never had to part like this before. It is simply legendary. No, it is mythical. We definitely need a large theatre so we can convey the impression of this grandeur to the spectators. It's going to be difficult, but we'll manage it. But it will be more expensive. It would appear you like it here. Ha! <laughs> like it? It is fabulous! I almost feel like giving up. Not even the best of illusions could possibly imitate this. But say, what brings you to us, Tangdil? Every step from here on is more dangerous than the last. Are you sure you want to continue on our journey with us? Of course. Every story needs an end. What kind of play would it be without a third act? There is no way I'm going to let Namora ride into battle on her own. I will be there to assist her. Why didn't you say that Namora is half-elf? If our spectators knew, they would run away screaming. So I'm sure you'll understand that we couldn't tell a group of armed dwarves either. You have to admit that you don't know how you would have reacted if Nemora had revealed herself in Mifidania. Fear and hatred of the Alpha is deeply rooted. You already know her, Tungdil. She has skills, but her lineage does not determine how she thinks and acts. She is the love of my life, and I would go crazy if I were to lose her. And how is your new play coming along? Good, very good. The band of adventurers who set off to defeat Nodon, aided by the Queen of the Dwarves from the Kingdom of the Firstlings. It's going to be a real challenge to present this story in all its greatness. Do you already have a title? I haven't decided for sure yet, but at the moment I'm thinking along the lines of the heroic dwarves and their loyal companions who opposed Nodon despite all the challenges to destroy him and save Girdelgard. I must go. Rest now. Rest? Haven't you seen? There are machines that keep the whole city alive. I must take a look. You guess that this water powers all the machines in the underground city. A masterpiece of engineering. I've gathered all of the metal we need for keen fire. I'm ready to depart. You nod and then look her solemnly in the eyes. Once we set off, stay in the background, keep out of fights, and avoid all danger. The female dwarf's expression darkens. Shall we engage in a trial fight, Mr. Dwarf? No, no, Bivrakus. No, I, I know that female dwarves can fight. It's because of the axe. You're the only one who can forge it. If something happens to you, we won't be able to stop Nodon. The face of the smith relaxes, and then a smile appears on her lips. I can look after myself. Greetings, Queen Xamtis. The Queen bows her head slightly, prompting you to speak. Please excuse me for asking, Your Highness, but how is it that a queen is sitting on the Firstling throne? 
The Queen smiles. She has clearly been expecting the question. It began with an argument. My father valued my mother's advice, but disputed her ability to lead the kingdom. This frustrated her, and she demanded the chance to prove the contrary. In the end, they agreed that my mother would govern the Firstlings for 14 orbits. And during this time, there was an attack by trolls, and my mother put them to flight with cunning and bravery. When my father demanded the throne again, she defied him, and the clans followed her. The other kingdoms were appalled and refused to receive my mother, but our kingdom saw that she was a good queen. And when she died 230 cycles ago, the people demanded that I should follow her onto the throne. Is everything ready for our journey to the Kingdom of the Fifthlings? We have provided wagons for you and your companions. Are your preparations complete? Yes, we are ready. The Queen nods slowly. Rally your companions. I will march east with my host, but don't be misled. The fate of the perished land is in your hands, not mine. May you succeed and return unhurt. Vrakas be with you. Plains of Tabain are the most fertile in Girdlegard, and rightly give the kingdom its nickname of the Breadbasket. The east of the land has been in revolt since the perished land advanced and the peace seems to have broken in the heartland too, as a group of strangers crawl out of a hole in the ground. Why don't we just look for a tunnel that hasn't collapsed? And what if we don't find one? If we're overground, we at least know that there's a way, even if it's dangerous. Let's go. Rudeka is, contrary to what the name suggests, a large city. If Rodario is to be believed, more than 70,000 people live here, a number that you find it hard to even imagine. But while you walk through the streets, you don't doubt that it's the truth. Never before have you seen such huge masses of people. If we are looking for somewhere to quench our thirst or for a roof over our heads, then I would recommend the Golden Well Tavern. And we can find everything we need for the rest of our journey at the Big Market. Just say where you want to go, Tangdil, and I'll show you the way. You follow Rodario through the lively streets until he reaches a run-down, two-story building. You hope that this dump isn't the tavern that Rodario recommends. You prepare yourself for the worst, but the inside of the tavern surprises you all. The walls are clad with dark, finely ornamented wood. The floor is clean, the tables are weighed down with good food, and a hot fire is burning in the fireplace. One should never judge a book by its cover. The guests look you over full of curiosity, and many nod a greeting. The haggard woman behind the bar greets you loudly. Rodario, you old rogue! What are you doing here? And you've got dwarves with you! <laughs> I don't see one my whole life and then several come along in the same month! We are on an important mission, Madame Flory, and could do with a place to stay the night. Rodario introduces you and negotiates a good price for a few beds and a night's lodgings. Sorry for asking, but... You said you'd seen some other dwarves recently. You're thinking of Gandagar's group and wonder whether they might have reached the Kingdom of the Fifthlings already. Yes, a nice bloke from the West. Paid for his room for a month in advance and then disappeared. Travelling lights. The landlady's expression darkens. That was three weeks ago. If he doesn't come back soon, I'll have to release the room. You give Namora a sign and sneak onto the first floor. The half-alf appears moments later. To your surprise, she has Balandis with her, who must have caught something of what was said. I want to know who the dwarf who is sneaking around here is. Perhaps he belongs to Gandagar's group. After apologising to various guests for intruding, you are left with just one untried door. Namora picks the lock and you enter the room unseen. The room is bigger than all the rooms in the tavern you have seen so far, and all just for one guest. There are maps, various pieces of notepaper, and three notebooks on the table. 
The notes are partly written in Dwarvish and partly in the language of humans. The three of you scan through them until Balandis draws your attention to a map on which the route from the kingdom of the firstlings to the kingdom of the fifthlings is marked. What would make a firstling travel to the perished land, or even to the kingdom of the fifthlings? You believe you've found an explanation. Here, this letter. I have found a way, but I don't know if I will return safely with Star Slasher. That's why I leave to you, dear Barris, my notes, may you, and, and so on. Star Slasher? You have come across this name in the notes a few times already, but you just shrug your shoulders and throw the letter back onto the table in disappointment. You had hoped to have found out some news on the whereabouts of the other group. Uh, a sword. Apparently it was given to Gizelbert I and I by a caravan travelling from the other lands. It seems we're dealing with a treasure hunter. The big market at the city's south gate certainly lives up to its name. You have never seen a market on such a scale. Stands, large and small, as far as the eye can see. Everything you could possibly need can be found here, as well as plenty of things that seem to have no use at all. While you push your way through the crowd to get to the trader Rodario wants to introduce to you, you overhear two peasants talking about elves. No, I tell you, it was elves. Pale skin, pointy ears. Yeah, something strange is going on these days. Old Trunderwood from down Acre Hill Way said he saw some pointy ears too. Come to think of it, where's he been all week? Here we are. Rodario's sudden announcement draws your attention away from the locals to the tent that you're now standing in front of. Welcome to Brand's Popery. Whatever your heart may desire, I can supply. Once again, you are received warmly by the guests and Madame Flory at the Golden Well Tavern. You are woken with a jolt in the middle of the night by a blood-curdling scream. You look around in panic and see that the others have been woken too, but only Geralda has beads of sweat on her brow. She is breathing heavily. Concerned, you go over to her. I can remember. The Alpha. They are doing experiments on the children of the Smith. We have to save them. Alpha? E experiments? What are you talking about? I can remember everything. Or at least some of it. I know that I was taken prisoner by the Alpha, along with other dwarfs. They experimented on us, and I somehow escaped. Where was this exactly? They are... here? Nearby. It was a... a village, I think. An Alfar village in Tabain? Doesn't sound very likely. By Rackus, if the Alfar are experimenting on dwarves, we can't just ignore it. We have to free the prisoners. We can't save the world if we ignore the suffering right in front of our eyes. We will help Geralda. Boandal and the others accept your decision. Geralda nods at you gratefully. When you reach Acre Hill, there isn't a single villager in sight. An uneasy feeling creeps over you, which finally turns into certainty when you see red paintings on the walls of the houses. Alpha.
The pictures, painted in blood, tell the horrifying story of how the Alpha came to the village and killed the inhabitants. You also find a few elaborately carved bones, some larger ones, like those of humans, some smaller and stronger, like those of dwarves. When you reach the other end of the village, disgust is written in the faces of your companions. None of you says a word. As expected, you don't find any survivors, but there are also no undead. The perished land has not yet advanced this far. You discover some footprints on the northern edge of the village. It was orcs. Looks as though they waited here while the point ears wreaked havoc in the village. It seems like they moved on towards the north. You gather all the bones you can find together and burn them. You wash over the paintings with water from the well. You weren't able to prevent this gruesome incident, but you don't want to leave a single trace of it behind. You walk through the villages that once blossomed, but are now deserted due to the advance of the parish land. The colour has drained away from the wood of many of the houses, just as it has from the countryside itself. A carpet of withered plants rustles and crackles under your feet. You don't know if the perished land can ever be driven away again, and even if it can, it is questionable whether people will ever live here again. You sigh, and try to drive these dark thoughts away from your mind. The path to Lake Fire lies in front of you. That is where the dragon Brambusil is said to have dwelt, before being killed by the fifthlings, so they could light the dragon fire forge with his flames. Rodario sings a song about the dreadful might of the dragon, and you all look down into the flames below with reverence. When you finally turn away, you think you can see a slight look of sorrow in Boindil's face. Sadness at the fact that the dragon has already been defeated by someone else. Ooh, do you smell that? Come! Oink, oink! Without even waiting for you, Boindil runs over the hill and disappears behind it. You follow him, and as you reach the brow, you see a very strange scene before you. I told you, you shouldn't touch them! But I was hungry! Yes? Damn oh, yes, yes. things! He hardly put up yes? a fight! Fought well and yet lost. Kill! Ah. on its huh? way! I was expecting yeah. more of a battle! Uh huh? Oink, oink, little peggies! Ha ha ha! That was good training! What is it? Yes? Yeah! Uh huh? Hey, oink, oink, little peggies! What is it? Huh? What is it? Uh, I was expecting more of a now? Huh? Vile creature! And again! Ha ha! And what now? Vile creature! Oink oink, little peggies! Ha ha ha! Yeah! Vile creature! Yeah! What is it? Huh? Who's next? Oink, oink, little peggies! <laughs> Vile creature! He cheated! Yes? Uh huh? Yeah! Vile creature! Understood. On my way. 
Attack! I need some assistance! I can't hold them back! Vile creature! Huh? Understood. At once. Fabracus! Yeah! End it! Yeah! Fabracus! On my way. Yeah! At once. On my way. On my way. Yeah! End it! Vile creature! At once! Yeah! Attack! Killed! End it! Favrakas! Yeah! End it! Vile creature! Favrakas! Attack! And again! End it! Attack! Vile creature! Favrakas! Understood. End it! Killed! On my way. Attack! Favrakas! And again! Yeah! Attack! Vile creature! End it! Yeah! The chaotic battle between the Orcs, the Undead and you comes to the best possible conclusion. No one else is standing but you. You decide to have a little look around. The closer you get to the murky pool, the worse it stinks of decay and death. At first you thought it was only dirty water, but for as much as you can make out through the gloom, it seems almost black and has wondrous streaks. It's a map of the surroundings. Not far from your current position is a place clearly marked with a red cross. Is it another Orc camp, or even the Alfar camp? You mark the place on your own map. You tremble at the thought that you could end up the same way. You hope that one of your companions would have sympathy with you if you were to die in the Perish Land. With the probable location of another camp up your sleeve, you continue on your way. With every day you get nearer to the Grey Range and Geralda gets more restless. Finally, she takes you to task. Why are we on the way to the Kingdom of the Fifthlings? You said we would free the imprisoned dwarfs, Tongdil. Don't worry, Geralda. I just wanted to take a look around. We're still searching for the imprisoned dwarfs. The female dwarf looks into your eyes for a moment, then nods. I cannot rest while I know that the Alpha are experimenting on our people. Geralda struggles to keep pace all day, and when you see her struggling, you give the order to set up camp for the night earlier than usual. Are you alright? The female dwarf looks ill, and as she's aware of the fact, she doesn't even try to make excuses. The potion! It's finished! I need more of it! She looks at you imploringly, as if you could help her. Over the next few days, Geralda's condition grows increasingly worse. She begins to shiver, and more than once you catch her muttering to herself and glancing at Andakai surreptitiously. The Mega claims she does not know what kind of potion it is and why Geralda might need it. You believe her 
but you also notice that Andukai doesn't really seem interested in finding a solution to the problem either. You reach the place that was marked on the Orc's map, and judging by the site you are presented with, there is no doubt. This is where the Alpha did their experiments. Dwarves! Oh, how glad I am to finally see members of my own race again. How glad I am to see anyone at all who doesn't want to kill me. We're here to save you. We've heard that Alpha are experimenting on dwarves. Where are the others? They... I am the last one. There's me too. You! Ah! So you escaped! Oh! I should have known it. You and Geralda, you know each other? She was already here when I arrived. The Alpha did experiments on her. They fed her with a tincture from this device, and then it was as if she was... as if she was a doll. She had to follow their orders. They trained her in battle, and she could... she could do Alpha magic. I swear it. But the last time, something was different. She fought against the orders of the Alpha, beheaded one of them in the end. She set me and the other prisoners free and ran away in the chaos. The Alpha recaptured all of us, apart from her. Where are the Alpha? I forget it. Yes? That's a good idea. What is it? What is it? Huh? Interested. This is going to hurt. What is it? Oink, oink, little peggies! Pleasure. We hardly put up a fight! Yes? Now you've got me interested. Huh? Oink, oink, little peggies! <laughs> Who's next? I want to go. I'm up to my idea. Oink, oink, little peggies! <laughs> Damn Where are you? you? As a child, power! Damn Where are you? you? Oink, oink, little peggies! <laughs> oh, 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 idea. Huh? On my way. Yeah! Huh? Attack! Ah. Pleasure. And Free my ah. power! Yes, I, I can't do that yet! Please wait a moment! Ah. Yeah. Yes? Hmm? What is it? What is it? Huh? Huh? Attack! Yes? I'll 
creature. Oh, oh my god! Idea. Oh, of course! Yes. Oh, that's a bad idea. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Of course! Oh, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, oh, my god! Yes? Die! Yes! Take off my gloves. Over there? Now you've got what? Now! Stop. What is it? We hardly put up a fight! Come on, a bad idea. And again! Yeah. It. End it! And I didn't even take off my gloves! I this is going to hurt! End ah. it! Sir. What is huh? it? I'm oh, gone! Yes? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Huh? I'm not a bad idea. idea. Now you've got what is it? Oh, oh, I have you. Down oh, in my you. car. What a waste of time. the peggies. <laughs> yes, a bad idea. Oh, oh, of course. Yes, 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 a bad idea. Oh, oh, of course. This is going to go on. Huh? Yeah! Yes? He hardly put up a fight! Not a bad idea. Damn it! Fire you! Yeah! And You're my power! Oh, oh, way! Oh, way! Yes? What is it? Huh? Oink, oink, little peggies! <laughs> and I didn't even take off huh? my gloves. He hardly yeah. put up a fight! Of ruckus. Attack! I was hoping never to see a single Shadow Mare again after Greenglade. Good job, there was two of them then! Ha! <laughs> Let's have a look around. Maybe there are more survivors, or we might find out something about the potion that Geralda needs. Even without having any knowledge of these things, you recognize a laboratory, similar to the ones you saw in Lot Yonan's vaults. Only this laboratory seems to be portable, so that it could be taken with you on journeys. They must be some of the missing villagers. You wonder whether the Alpha killed them for fun or through their experiments. You hope that they didn't suffer for long, even though you know better. A rucksack, containing everything needed for a few days in the wilderness, and an exotic-looking sword. A rucksack. The danger is over. Once and for all. Now the horror finally comes to an end. The Alf has been beheaded. He is dead. And even the Perish Land won't be able to make him rise again. Well, that's... that's him. I remember now. He forced me to drink a potion. 
That's what gave me my powers. I killed him and ran away. On closer inspection, you see a small rolled up note in the Alf's hand. A recipe. If I had to guess, probably for Geralda's potion. You have no idea what to do with the various devices and ingredients, but it should be easy for Andakai, as an experienced mega and alchemist, to brew Geralda's potion. You don't wish to spend the night amongst the dead, so you set up camp a little way off. You decipher the recipe for Geralda's potion together with Andakai and Namora. All in all, the equipment and the process is not hard to understand, despite being a little strange. And the ingredients take some getting used to, even for me. This black water and elf blood, for example. Is this what gives Geralda her powers? Andakai nods. It gives her powers and makes her dangerous. What will she do if the potion runs out and she is driven to madness by thirst? She could force me to brew more and more of the potion for her and find a way to supply the elf blood that is needed for it. Andakai's gaze pierces you. I can mix a poison that looks just like her potion. She trusts you, Tungdil. If you give it to her, she will drink it, and we will remove an uncontrollable danger from Girdleguard. You can't bring yourself to say it, but you have to agree with the Mega. You glance at the floor, and a brief nod follows. And we should destroy the recipe. This should never happen again. Without another word, Andakai gets to work. After two hours, the Mega is finished and comes to you. She is carrying two files that look just like the one Geralda has. The file on the right is the potion. The one on the left is the poison. Andakai gives you the two files. Decide wisely. Before you can say anything, she has already turned away and is marching at a swift pace towards Jerun. Tungdil, is the potion ready? You only just managed to hide the files from Geralda. Sure, here's the potion. We followed the recipe to the word. You pass Geralda the poison. She takes it with thanks opens the lid, and takes several greedy swigs. Thank you, Tongdil. What would I do without... Ugh. <sighs> what is that? Ugh. It's burning! <coughs> <coughs> you... You've poisoned me! I... I'm sorry. There's... There's no other choice. You are too much of a danger. You're just like the others! I curse you! With a last pained scream, Geralda collapses in front of you. When the others come, you leave them to wonder what has happened. Did you do the right thing? She's dead. Take her away. Jeroen follows Andakai's orders immediately. The Mega takes you by the shoulder and pulls you aside. Good decision, Tungdil. One has to be able to make tough decisions as a leader, and you have done so today. As night falls, you find yourselves on a hot mountain face covered in sharp crags. You would favour pretty much anywhere else to spend the night, but it is too dark to go any further. You are woken in the middle of the night by Boindel. Scholar, can you smell it? There are piggies nearby. You sniff deeply, but don't smell anything but the stench of sulphur. But you do see something moving in the shadows and are immediately wide awake. Yes? Come here, you! 
Battle, you finally have time to catch your breath. You check the others one by one to see how they are. Bavrigor seems out of it and is staggering with every step he takes. Bavrigor, are you all right? Agonizingly slowly, he turns to face you. Blood is flowing from his mouth and through his beard. I made a mistake. All strength slips from his body and he falls forward. An arrow is protruding from his back. 
Andakai, Bavragor has been hit! You immediately rush towards him. Valandis, next to you, takes his hand. Too late. The arrow was poisoned, I can feel it. I hadn't planned to return to the kingdom of the secondlings. But I did at least want to complete my task to die in glory. You won't die, Bavrakor. Andakai, can't you? You turn to the Mega, but one look at her face robs you of all hope. She shakes her head imperceptibly. We are in the perished land, aren't we? Let me die. Then I can at least complete my task. My defiance will be stronger than the urge to do evil. Before you can object, Boindil lays a hand on your shoulder. You know yourself how stubborn we are, Scholar. We should grant him his wish. If he turns on us, then I will take care of him myself. You've heard about dead dwarves on expeditions in the Perish Land defying the bloodlust for many days. But you want to find a better way. Bavragor's breathing is becoming shallower, until it finally stops completely. While Balandis is still sobbing next to you, the stonemason rises suddenly. His face is pale and his eyes seem empty. Even death can't stop me. I told you, my defiance is stronger. None of you really know what to say, and finally Bavrigor compels you to continue your journey. You can see the inner conflict in the stonemason's face, and you don't know how long he can resist it. You continue on your way with an uneasy feeling. You finally reach the place where Keenfire will take on form, the stronghold of the Fifthlings with the hottest forge in Girdlegard, Dragonfire. This is where evil first entered Girdlegard. A disgrace for the dwarves, who were given the task of protecting it by Varrakus. Since then, the perish land has spread. Alfar and orcs have invaded, and the elves almost eradicated. But you have decided to face up to the evil. You will forge keen fire and stop Nodon, or die trying. You enter the old stronghold with determination. Whoa! The Fifthlings really knew how to build a stronghold! And we're probably the first dwarves in a thousand cycles to enter these halls. Come on, you beasts! I may be the last, but I will take at least four dozen more of you down with me! Gundagar! Hold on, my king! Oh, there's a surprise! Is there some courage hidden inside the little gem cutter after all? Come on, let's help Gandagar. Yes, not a bad idea. What, what is it? What do you want me to do? Huh? Huh? That'll be safe, will it? Yeah. Yes? He, he has? Hey, how about some help? Just die! I need support! What do you want me to do? Oh, yeah, Boy, it's oh, it's little oh, piggies! <laughs> so, is that a good idea? Here, yeah. oh, oh, put up a fight, you insist! Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Die! Yeah. Yes? Yeah. What is it? 
Oink, oink, little piggies! Huh? <laughs> yeah! Please wait a moment. What do you want me to do? Yes. And again. Oh, oh, ah, is that a good idea? Oink, oink, little piggies! <laughs> uh, that'll be safe, will it? Understood. Oh, then... Uh huh? Yeah! Yeah! Who's next? Huh? Come Tire here, you! If you insist! Yeah! He hardly put up a fight! Yeah! Yes? End it! Oink, oink, killed. little piggies! <laughs> Oh, is that a good idea? Ha! I got one! Ah, yes, yes. yes, that'll be safe, will it? Oh, you weren't expecting that, were you? My king, you're alive. Oh. Chongdel, I would have never have thought I'd be so happy to see you again. You seem to have fared better than we. What happened to you? Where are the others? They are dead. Only I remain. Your learned tongue refuses to do its job. You consider how it was you who sent these people to their ruin. You don't see any accusation in Gandagar's expression, just grief and determination. And now that you are here, I carry the hope that their sacrifice was not in vain. In a few short words, you give account of everything that has happened to you on your way to the kingdom of the Fifthlings. Gandagar listens silently and nods now and then. You have done well. You appear to be a better leader than I expected, Tungdil Goldhand. I don't know. Half the time I was advised what to do next. It is our destiny to follow the untrodden path. Leaders take one step after the other. They never stand still. And if you look back and ask yourself what if, you will never find the courage to take another step. We have to get to the forge. Let's forget our contest and work together. I agree. We have seen the spread of the Perish Lands and the beasts of Teon wanted us to keep away from this place. Maybe there is some truth in your story about Keenfire. You tense your shoulders and strengthen the grip on your weapon. Let's find out. Not so fast, groundlings. Are you going to stop us, little man? Even greater armies haven't been able to stop us. An evil grin spreads across the Famulus's face. Oh, I know. But how about this? Finally, a real challenge! Everyone else, keep your hands off it! Understood? Yes? What do you want huh? me to do? Oink, oink, little piggies! Oh, what's your bad idea? Be safe. Oink, oink, little piggies! Oh, well, I think... oh, huh? He, he what is, is it? Something bad? Huh? Oh, 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 is that a good idea? Oh, I'm so with you. Oh, here, you. Oh, oh, he's pretty what big. is it? On my way. Yes, yes, yes. On my way. Go. Turn yeah. I just need a little rest. Understood. At once. On my way. Yeah! Yeah! On my way. Yeah! 
Understood. On my way. Understood. Vile creature. At once. End it. On my way. At once. Favrakis! On my way. At once. Understood. Yeah! Yeah! At once. Yeah! Understood. Yeah! Yeah! I can't do that yet! Understood. On my way. Please wait a moment! Understood. I can't do that yet! Please wait a moment! Attack! End it! On my way. Understood. On my way. Understood. On my way. Understood. At once. On my way. Understood. At once. On my way. Yeah! Yeah! I can't do that yet! Understood. At once. Attack! Yeah! Please wait a moment! End it! Killed! Attack! Vile creature! At once! End it! Yeah! 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 Understood. Yeah! Attack! Yeah! On my way. At once. On my way. Understood. And again! Tongdil, let's hope that was the last obstacle on the path to your victory. I've already said it once, but I will say it again. I don't want the throne, and I never did. All I care about is saving Girdlegard. If I don't manage, make sure that Keenfire is forged, and promise me that you will work with Namora and Keenfire against Nodon. Gandagar bows his head. By Vrakus and Gizelbert Ironai, in whose kingdom we now stand, I swear I will not rest until Nodon is dead. But you will be by my side. Yes, over oh, there, Glad. Give us a chance. Get at your service. Uh, oh. Now. Uh, Kill. Uh, at your service. Get uh, to uh, I understand. Uh, Even I am not that wild creature. Kill. Now. Uh, 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 Good night. Oh. What? Mm. Hmm? I'm Look a my hammer! Yes? <laughs> I just I think too much for you, were they? Even I am not that pleased! Oh, oh. I... Die. At your service. Huh? First, how are they? Huh? I, I need some help. Yes. Oh, there yes. He is. Help. Bloody. Get ah, where are you? Excuse me, though. but I'm going to have to do this. Die. Yeah. Very 
finished. This my is going hammer. to be bloody. I'm serious. I'm going to have to get it. Yes. Don't get one of that. Take the shot. My hammer. Kill. What's up? Serious, but I'm going to have to do this. Yes. <laughs> a bit too much for you, was I? Come on, victory! It won't last long. Another one of us. I understand. That was a choice. Prepare yes, yourself. Going to be bloody, huh? At your service. Yeah. 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 I'm not like that. Too Too many enemies. Oh, Please, oh, excuse me, but I'm going to have to do this. Huh? Die. Even I am not that quick. Get oh, well. there. Glad. Yeah. Oh, oh, well. Well. Glad. Oh, yeah. Glad. Excuse me, but I'm going to have to do this. There. Get the same choice. I'm oh, away. I understand. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to do this. I'm away. I understand. Get the same choice. Yes, it's going to be bloody. Vile creature. Oh, I understand. I'm I'm just... My hammer. Kill. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, yes, but I'm going to have to do this. Yes. Again. Oh, it. This is going to be bloody. Vile creature. I'm I'm away. Away. Oh, I understand. Oh, it. My hammer. Kill. Oh, it. Glad. It's my last one. Kill. Oh, 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 this is going to be bloody and again. I'm not there. Glad. Get us away now. I understand. I'm not there. Glad. I'm not there. I understand. Get us away now. Glad. I was so jealous. I'm not there. Excuse me, but I'm going to have to do this. Huh? At your service? What? Swift and awesome. Shh. I'm serious, me, but I'm going to have to do this. Vile creature. This is going to be bloody. Hmm? Yes? Yeah! Huh? I'm oh. down! Oh. Oh, 
Who oh, saves me? But I'm going to have to do this. Oh, oh, oh. Choice. I'm not oh, going to understand. Oh, I'm not there. Glad. Give me some choice. Kill. I'm not there. Glad. Give me some choice. I'm not there. Glad. Give me I understand. I'm not there. Glad. This is going to be bloody. Oh! Nah! Get away! Get away! Get away! I understand. Get away! Get away! Get away! Get away! About time for a plan, scholar. Enough. The time has come. Not on. Open the gate. I'll hold him off for as long as I can. Back, you maggots. They belong to me. That isn't not on. It's. Pretoria. It makes no difference. The gate is bolted shut. Later, get inside! You recognize the dwarf standing in front of you in shimmering armor because you have seen his features more than once, wrought in gold and vracassium and flaunted on the walls on your way through the kingdom of the fifthlings. Gizelbert Ironeye, the progenitor of the fifthlings. Welcome, whoever you may be. I hope your coming is a good omen. You look at the ten dwarves with their pale faces and eyes that seem slightly vacant, as if they were in a trance. They are wearing wonderfully crafted armor, and the resolve that Vracus gave his people can be read in each and every face. It... it really is you, isn't it? We are the last of the Fifthling Clan. We have defied the hordes of evil since the downfall of my realm. We fell against the Elfar and were brought back to life by the perished land, but instead of serving it, we fought against it. We are rather hard to defeat, and each of my men has slain more monsters than any other dwarf before them. But. Such victories are a meager consolation after such a loss. And you don't feel any hate towards other dwarves or all things living? You are thankful for the old king and his men. But you experience firsthand what power the perished land exerts over those it has in its grasp. We have learned. Eleven hundred cycles have been enough to silence the hate inside us. You look at the legendary king's face and see no signs of lying, but also no joy, no hope, no life. Just sadness and the irrepressible defiance of the dwarves. I thank you for your help. Without you, we would have been finished. Those creatures were content to just watch us for an age, but for the last few orbits, they have been trying to take the forge. I dare say the change has something to do with your wee band, eh? We are representatives of the Firstlings, the Secondlings and the Fourthlings, accompanied by the Mega, Andakai, the Tempestuous and friends. It's grim for Girdlegard. The magical barriers that kept the Perish Land in check for centuries are destroyed. A Magus by the name of Nod On controls the magic and he can't be killed. Not with any ordinary weapon. The Dragonfire Forge, can we light it? No. 
but it's the only place where we can forge Keenfire, the only weapon that can defeat Nodon. The furnace cannot be lit because it never went out. We defended it against invaders from the beginning. It is burning as hot and bright as ever. Vrakas must have known we would need it again one day. Now, rest. The gates will not fall. We'll see to that. Permit yourselves as much sleep as you need, and then we will get to work. The sight of the undead dwarves who saved you makes you feel melancholy. You knew there were no living fifthlings left, but the fact that they had spent the last thousand cycles as undead makes this truth even more painful. You are very thorough, Honorable Mega. I should have asked the orc to hit me on the mouth so that you could have kissed me back into the world. Fair damsels only kiss brave warriors. An actor can be many things, including a warrior. That is true, but your privates have fought so many battles throughout the land that I couldn't trust that their bearer wouldn't switch sides as soon as an opportunity arises. Stick with the women who adore you, actor. You smirk. It would seem that Rodario is in good health. You don't need to worry about him. You have travelled far with Jeroon, but you still don't know what is hidden behind the mask. The longer you look at him, the more you believe you can see a weak glow behind the steel face. You're wondering what is hidden behind the mask. You sound as though you know. When I was little, my mother told me about a being, the king of all creatures of Tion and Samusin. It wrestles with the strong and destroys the weak and incapable. His eyes are said to glow blue-violet, and the sight of him is enough to scare off the weakest. All fear him, the son of Samusin. You aren't sure whether the Mega is joking with you. Would she really travel with the son of her god? The Mega leaves you with a meaningful smile. Several smiths could work on masterpieces of metalworking at the same time here. The fifthlings have always been the best smiths, and you can hardly imagine what kind of amazing legendary pieces must have been created on these anvils. The hottest forge in Girdelgard, Dragonfire. The fire is said to originate from the dragon Branbusil, who was hunted by the fifthlings. You are glad that you didn't have to overcome any dragons on your journey, although you know someone who would have been thrilled by the challenge. The Magister Technicus looks up from his work. Ah, Tungil, look what I found. Here, there are narrow steps on the walls of the chimney, and if you look right up to the top, you can see the blue of the sky. Hmm, very good. That could be our way out once Keenfire is finished. As you approach Nomura, she is lost in thought, massaging her wrists. She contributed a bracelet made of teonium to complete the unusual alloy needed for Keenfire. The bracelet was a present from my mother to protect me from the powers of good. Well, as it would seem, I am on the other side now. I've no use for it. Hopefully you won't become too good. Keenfire can only be wielded by a foe of the dwarves. You smile at her encouragingly, and she reciprocates your glance. Both of you know that the Alpha will always be enemies of the Dwarves. You look at Balandis's sweaty skin, her muscles, and her hair. When you become aware of what you are doing, you stammer. Um, can I help in any way? I think the knot is coming then. She indicates to her back with a short nod of her head. <clears throat> she smiles at you radiantly. Thank you for your help. 
You feel you're melting in her smile like steel in the forge. Of course, you're welcome. King Gizelbert I and I. I still can't believe that I've met you in person. My time passed long ago. Do people still talk about me? You think for a moment about how to answer. Many blame the Fifthlings, and thus their progenitor, for the extent the Perish land has advanced. Your name is not forgotten. The nod of the King's head is barely noticeable. The beasts are preparing to attack. You look at the solid iron doors and their fittings, which are protected by the runes of Vrakus. Didn't you say the furnace is safe? Long enough. We will hold the gates for as long as necessary, at any cost, but... You must be aware of what awaits us. Keep them at bay until we have forged the axe. Yes? Oh, oh, okay. Hmm? Not a bad idea. Of oh, course! Wild creature! What a waste of time! And what now? And what? What is it? It's a hurt! I didn't even take off my gloves. No chance. And I didn't even take off my gloves. Hmm? It was He hardly put up a fight! What a waste of time. Sammy's hint. This is the end. Who's next? Oink, oink, little peggies! <laughs> I must go. Uh huh? Yeah! I have Bowen yeah. Give me a hand! Please wait a moment! Understood. Yeah! At once. Yes? Attack! Killed! End it! Yeah! That's it. We've done it. May I? Of course. If it weren't for you, it would never have been forged. that will banish evil from Girdlegard. Now it all makes sense. All those cycles of perseverance, of fighting, the agony of being undead. Thanks and honor be to Vrakas. Tell the clans that we never gave up. The Fiftlings fought against evil for as long as they could. Here, keep this as a memento. Your gift is too generous. 
From what I have come to know of you, you deserve it more than any other. Just promise me one thing, Tangdil Goldhand. Rebuild my kingdom once you have freed Girdelgard and driven out the pestilence. Don't leave my kingdom to the creatures of Tion. And if he's with the Firstlings, or in Parista? I tell you, not on is still trying to crack Ogre's death! We should go back there first! Why don't we ask them? <laughs> ha! Oi, oi, little piggies! <laughs> We've got to question one of them. I knew it! Peggy thief! How did you get into the tunnel? Even the dwarves have forgotten it. We found the way in at Ogre's death. Wasn't hard. In Ogre's death? That's impossible! Impossible! We've taken the stronghold a while ago. Been there myself. We've killed all of your friends. <laughs> they were pff, yummy. Point deal. I have seen Ogre's death myself. You could never have conquered the stronghold. Certainly not so quickly. Think again, Grandling. Was no problem once the bridge was lowered and the tunnel shown us. You're saying that you had help from inside. <laughs> You're not as stupid as you look, Groundling. One of your kind lot helped us. A thirdling. Uh, where is your master, Orc? Where is Nod On? Why should I tell you that, Groundling? The choice is yours. Either you discuss it with me, with Jeroon, or with Boindil. Who's it to be? The master isn't Black Saddle. He's going to destroy the groundlings hiding there. <laughs> the stronghold on Black Saddle? There aren't any dwarves left there. There are. They fled there and the master has surrounded them. It's just a matter of time until... <laughs> this all sounds very bad indeed, Scholar! We must go to Black Saddle. There's nothing for it. If our friends have lured Nod on there, then we have to use this opportunity and strike him down with Keenfire. Ah, there he is! Nod on! Come on, let's go. We have to stop him. Namora, stay out of this and defend Keenfire. It is always a pleasure to run into you, Tungdil Goldhand. I've been waiting for you and your companions for a while now. And it would seem we have caused you a few losses. This ends here, Synthras. You took the words right out of my mouth. Leave none of them alive! What is it? Huh? Aye. Yes. And what now? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
to have to do this. Up yes. the stack. Up the stack. I do that. Boys, oh, go. Up the stack. 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 Oink, oink, little peggies! Ha ha ha! Is this going to be bloody? What is it? Uh, and I didn't even take off my gloves. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Vile creature! Oh my god! Oh my god! What a waste of time. Now you're Where is it? interested. I'm with you! Yes, yes! And I didn't do any of my guess. And of course! What a waste of time. I'm with you! Of course! Yeah. I'm going to have to do this. Yes, we hardly put up a fight. No chance. Vile what is it? That was a bad chance. idea. Come here, you! Your demise was inevitable! Interested. This is going to be bloody. That's a bad idea. Well, I can't understand. I want to have an idea. Come on, victory! Of course! And again! Come here, you! Come away! Huh? Ha ha! What is it? And what now? Oh! Vile creature! Every oh, my power! Bloody! Oh, oh, yes, yeah. Huh? Now you've got me interested. <laughs> no chance. Yes, oh, yes. my power! Service? Oh! At your service? He hardly yes. put up a fight! Come here, Let you! I won't wait you! And I don't want to take that. off my gloves. Now you've got what me is interested. It? Understand. Understand. Yeah, I'm glad. Vile creature, huh? Kill. What a waste of time. I'm going to have to do this. Oh, oh, I understand. What's that? I'm going to have to At your service? Huh? Hmm? What is it? I? Oink, oink, little piggies! Ha ha ha! Vile creature! 
danger. What is it? What a waste of time. Going. We must reach the tower before more reinforcements arrive. Hold it. If Nodon is here, then the Perish Land is here too, and no one wants to confront him again. Oh, what have we got here? The long-lost sun returns. I am glad that I met you here. I was afraid the Alf wouldn't leave anything for me. Bislipper, you return to the stronghold of your people, the stronghold of the Thirdlings. Ah, you really are clever. Gundraborn and Belendolin took a lot longer to realize who I am, but then it was already too late for them. I'll cut you into pieces, Thirdling. Uh-huh. I need help over oh here! My you. Hey! How about some help? What is and it? What now? Oh, That's a bad idea. Uh, I'm cheated! Oh, I'm going to go. place with me. Oh, yes, sir. Yes. yes? Yeah! Yeah! I can't do that yet! Yeah! On my way. Please wait a moment. At once. End it. Yeah! On my way. Understood. At once. Yeah! On my way. At once. On my way. At once. For Vrakus! Yeah! End it! Yeah! For Vrakus! 
hitting me pretty hard! I need help over here, quickly! Yeah! Understood. At once. Attack! Yeah! It's over, Bislapur. If you submit, Gandagar will... I don't care about Gandagar! I just needed someone on the throne I could steer as I wish. War against the elves was the goal. The kingdoms were to wear themselves out against the elves, then the children of Lorenbo would have had it easy. It was you who murdered Gandagar's father and brother, wasn't it? I would never do anything like that to another dwarf! Ah! Fool! You have no idea who you really are! This is an historic moment faced with the ultimate evil. The races of Girdelgard join forces. Ugh, I must pack this down. There's no dawn. We must take Nomura up there, clear the way for her, and then end it, Nomura. Kill! Huh? End it! Oh, we hardly put up a fight! Now you've got me interested. Do you think it's smart? Just let him die over here? All right then. Not a bad idea. If I have to. Huh? Die? At your service? Oh, yes, yes, I understand. It's I'm going to have to do this. And quiet. Yes, oh, yes, I understand. Master, they have destroyed the siege tower and Kai. There's nothing you can do to harm her. I will take care of her myself. Master, watch out! Uh, uh. I'll get the axe! Kill! Vile creature! Who's next? Huh? Understood. On my way. This axe, brother. I am not your brother, traitor. We are both the same, Tongdil. We are both children, nerdlings. I am not like you. You open the gates of Ogre's death. You have murdered dwarves. I am not a thirdling. I am a fourthling. Not like me, oh! <laughs> It is our destiny to avenge ourselves on the other's tongue deal. And in Nod On, we have finally found someone who can eliminate the other kingdoms for us! You have put Girdelgard in the hands of evil just to... No, not just, but precisely for that reason. To finally fulfill our destiny, as our kingdom has tried to do for thousands of cycles! Enough! You are completely blinded! Kill! End it! Yeah! Understood. Pile creature! Attack! Yeah! Have another victory! Die! Pavrakas! Yeah! Welcome End to it. the future! Yeah! It's a waste of time. Attack! Yeah! Pavrakas! I can't do that yet! No chance. Yeah! On my way. Please wait a moment. A victory for technology! 
Girdle Guard is ours! Yeah. What a waste of time! Attack! End it! Yeah! There is no greater goal for either of us than destroying the other kingdoms. When they are gone, all of the ranges belong to us! Don't talk as if it relates to me. I set off to stop Nodon and to save the Dwarven Kingdoms in Girdlegard. And that is exactly what I'm gonna do. I can't be a thirdling. Yes, you are one of us. I saw it immediately in the throne room of the Secondings. How did you learn to fight so well in such a short time if you hadn't inherited it? Listen deep inside yourself and you will recognize the truth. Rackers. If you kill me, you will destroy Girdle Guard. You can't stop the danger from the West. Only I can do that. That's why I am uniting Girdle Guard. You haven't united Girdle Guard under you. It has united against you. Your terror ends here and now. Huh? For Brackus. Yeah! The downfall of Girdle Guard will weigh upon your shoulders. You must let me live. No, we will protect Girdle Guard ourselves, just like we always have. This is a day of hope and optimism. Nodon is destroyed, and thus the power of the perished land is broken. We only managed to achieve this because the humans, the elves, and dwarven kingdoms forgot their hatred and stood strong together. Can there ever be a better sign for us to bury our feuds with each other? We have protected Girdlegard. Now, the hatred must be washed completely from our hearts. From this day on, we will write the chronicles of peace, compassion, and friendship. And here stands the dwarf who we all have to thank most of all, Tungdil Goldhand. You can be proud of yourself. Proud? That I am a thirdling? You've saved all of us. It doesn't matter who you are. The only thing that counts is what you've done. Do you think there might have been a glimmer of truth in Nodon's words? The danger from the West. <laughs> With you by my side, I won't shy away from any danger, Balandis.